This week's episode is sponsored by Change. Change is an online mentoring program that teaches people with no experience how to create a real profitable online business and e-commerce. I have been working with Ryan at Change for a few years now and attended many events and got to meet the amazing community of like-minded people. These guys are the best of the best. The support these guys offer is personal, no bots or employees, there's no experience needed, but like anything in life, it takes time as it's a real business with real results. For more information, go check out Ryan on Instagram at RyanJB and he will guide you through the steps to help build a successful business. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. Because we've not even got into the my old man's behaviour, his bully boy tactics, threatening him with fucking Reg Cray, Reg Cray ringing up the house, throwing acid over my mum's car, threatening to have a contract put out on my stepdad. You used to put your tongue in my mouth. I thought that was normal. So I then put my tongue in your mouth. You fucking filthy animal. Because I thought that was the norm. I didn't think there was anything wrong with not putting your tongue in your dad's mouth because you showed me that, you fucking pig. So my dad slept with Kate Cray behind Ron Cray's back. Not many people would do that, would they? I mean, I know I certainly wouldn't. I broke down. My brain was so frazzled and sizzled and fucked. I was too scared. Like I, I, had, I lived with severe anxiety for a long time after that. I mean, a lot, every day was haunting. Your dad first raped me when I was 13. Your dad first raped me when I was 13. And my stomach, it dropped like I was on a roller coaster. But what he done, he doesn't deserve to breathe. He's guilty of sin. He's done far more than what the public know, certainly than what, the, what he'll ever let on. Boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got Liam Tufts. Nice to meet you again. Liam, legend. Oh, yeah. yeah, really well, thank you. First and foremost, I just want to say thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me on, much appreciated. I was a big fan of your, what, five, six years ago, Facebook. I used to watch your videos, I actually dropped you a message to say an absolute class video. I was actually going through a lot of madness and your videos cheered me up with your dancing and your daftness. And obviously a lot of mad stuff then came out of your videos about your father and mm. stuff that he was involved in, that, that stuff. And I've got nothing but respect for you, how you own that, how you just keep going on with it and just can't be strong with it. Because a lot, I know I've had so many people on, it's broke them. A lot of people's took their own life and don't know how to kick on it. Obviously your humour can be a deflection of just trying to deal with it. But only thing you can do is deal with it. But Humour is, is essential because if you take every if you take every serious thing that happens in your life serious your whole world becomes serious and then that tension builds up and up and up and up and up and like you say the the, the pressure cooker can get too fucking powerful and before you know it, you don't know which way to turn and boom you get people that because they're not releasing it in some some format and i always used to use humor and i do quite like dancing as you know yeah. But you know what? I'm trying to cover. I'm trying to cover the few bits that you've just said there, and when you said that you reached out to me and sent me a message, by the time I would have read that, I was probably unpublished again, because I would always I'd build a following, then I'd say something that was over the line, well, in the eyes of the the big media companies, mm -hmm. and then they just without warning, bam, remove the account, and I'd be talking to people like privately that had their own issues, their own dramas, their own traumas. And a lot of them had abandonment issues. Ooh. 
And then when I got unpublished for the first time, like my biggest account I got up to was about a quarter of a million on Facebook. And well, that was the one that you, that you saw me on when, when it all went very dark with my old man, which we're obviously going to cover. And uh, all these poor souls that I would talk to and console and, you know, give them a little bit of strength that they need and tell them, no, 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 you're better than you think. You're bigger than you think. You can achieve more than you think. You know, believe it, then you'll achieve it. Remember who you are. Remember your worth. Get up, make your bed, iron your shirt, just little things like that. Just go and do something that makes you feel proud, something that you didn't do yesterday because you were too tired, too deflated, too fucked, whatever. So I'd keep in touch, not every single day because I've still got my own businesses to run and I've got my own life. But there's always a little something in me that I can't see someone on their knees. So I'd keep in touch with them. And then one of my first thoughts was when I got unpublished for the first time. I mean, I got, I've been unpublished so many times now that I'm just waiting for the next unpublishment. It's like, mm. oh, it's coming. So I, then, I now sort of think, why bother trying to build up an, another big platform because it's only going gonna, gonna, gonna to get taken away. Mm. But the first time I got unpublished, I thought, them people that rely on me, that I'm talking to privately, that have got abandonment issues, they're going to think I've been abandoned again. So that was, another, that was another problem with being unpublished on social media. And you know the way the algorithm works. You can set up an account the next day. But people just think, People think you're gone. So it's a shame I didn't see your message. What did you, what was the, what was the I message? I just said, mate, I'm going through changes myself and I'm seeing your videos, uh, buzzing for your video, cheered it up. And he replied like a few days later and he says, oh, oh I did reply. Yeah, you replied, man. And I was looking for the message, but I don't think I had an account because I'd have loved to have put it up. But because I was going through changes exactly at that time, I was wanting to be better. And yeah, I just, I seen your video, somebody had shared it and you were dancing about the kitchen. I done that, silly bastard. Like. But then I, I started watching more of your videos and they were quite uplifting. Mm. When you speak as well in your videos, you're confident and your videos seem to be on point, all one take and just obviously it might take a few chances to, to nail it. But when they were live, I thought, fucking hell. And then, I came across you sitting on the couch and you were talking about some dark shit, which we'll touch on later. But and I thought, wow, man, how does that man kick on? Because my I thought I had problems mm. when I started listening to yours. I thought, fuck me, my problems ain't that bad. Do you know what I mean? I was going through changes and trying to make a lot of different decisions and better decisions in my life. But when I heard your story, because I never really on social media, you never really heard stories like that. No that stuff, it, and you were the first I came across, and I thought that's a bit heavy. And I think it was a first, and it was by no means uh, a publicity stunt. Or it was by no means for attention, which my old man—that was what he was portraying out. Uh, oh, this is all for attention. This is for likes and shares, and it's like, no, this is doing me no favors at all. This is not what I'm about. Like airing my dirty laundry to fucking hundreds and thousands, sometimes millions of people is not where I want to be going in my life. I'm running businesses. I'm bettering myself. I'm supporting my own community. I'm raising people's spirits. I get a ma I like things that give me a buzz. Like I'm an, I'm an addict in one form or another. No matter what it is, if it gives me a buzz, even watching a horror film and it fucking makes me jump, it's like, cool, I fancy that again. <laughs> I've got an addictive personality. And raising people's spirits and building people up. And anyone that knows me, all of my inner circle will be the first to tell you he will give up his own life for months until he gets, until I get someone straight. I'd fucking love to name a couple of them, but I'd <laughs> love to name a couple of them, but, uh, but I won't out of pure love. But yeah, I get a buzz off helping people and raising people's spirits. And it's funny because when you said you thought that you had problems and you was going through some dark times and then you saw what I was going through and you realised that fucking hell, you know, there's people out there in worse predicaments. That's how I feel every day, irrespective of the traumas I've gone through. And I think it's essential that men do go through trauma because it changes you as a man and you see the world completely differently and you have a better understanding. You can look another man in the eye and say, I get it, rather than sort of wing it. But I always think if I've got two arms, two legs and my eyesight, I'm winning. And this is just a hurdle. But I do know that there's other people that haven't quite got that mindset or the support. But most importantly, I know that there's people out there that have been through. I mean, don't get me wrong. Fucking hell. 
I had to overcome a, a, an almighty hurdle. And it was relentless with the old man because he's got a narcissistic personality disorder. And a lot of people, if you go up against a piece of shit like that, you come out with PTSD and you're troubled for life. So I've done well to come out unscathed. As far as I'm concerned, I'm relatively unscathed. And I'll tell you why I think that as we, as we go on. Uh, but I always put into perspective that there is always somebody out there that's in their bedroom, in their one bedroom apartment with no friends, no partner, no children, and all they've got is their shadow as a company and they're looking at a noose or they're looking at a bottle of pills. And I think, you know what? I'm not there. So someone's worse off than me. So if I can, you know, big strong geezer runs a security firm, I've got no problem showing my vulnerable side. Hey, I'm human. Doesn't matter on the outside how you look, whether you've got tattoos or you got, you know, you lift weights or you box or you do whatever. Like your heart's your heart, your soul's your soul, your feelings are your feelings, and you can't control them as much as you need to the best you can. You just simply can't if you're in pain. So I think if I can ease somebody else's pain by showing them a little bit of mine, sort of done a good deed. And hopefully the karma train will pull up at my station and be kind to me. And so far, life's been pretty good to me. Yeah, even though all the shit you went through your life, you still, like I say, you handle it and you still try and live a good fucking life What people think. He's got a nice car, he's got a nice house. Yeah. He's misses, like travels the world. Like, it's not too bad compared to, but when people actually get an understanding of what actually went, you went through, you're going to get so much love for it. Before we get into everything, I always like to go back to the start of my guests. Get a wee bit of understanding about you, Liam, where you grew up and how it all began. Well, I'm from a town called Crawley, Creepy Crawley, Broadfield. Anyone from Crawley will know that if you can imagine Crawley as a human body, Broadfield is the anus. <laughs> <laughs> it's the anus of the, of the human body. Yeah, so True Four Crescent, council estate, raised by my mum and my nan. And I want to get this out there because I don't know because like obviously none of this is rehearsed. It's all off the cuff. And this morning I found out that my dad's brother's died. So I'm not even really prepared for today. And it's ironic that we're going to talk about this piece of shit. And today his brother died. And my first message to my auntie and my cousins that have been messaging me was, it should have been Peter. Peter is obviously my old man, uh, not his brother, who lived a very, 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 very tortured life. Uh, but yeah, so... Born and raised in Crawley. Broadfield was where I was initially from on a council estate, rough and ready. Still very proud of where I come from. In fact, I'm delighted that I've come from there. And I like it when I talk to people that are from Crawley or Broadfield and I can say, ah, oh, it's a shithole. And they look like that. And I say, no, nah, I can say that because I'm from there. It's a bit like when someone's going bald, I can pull them on it. It's like, well, nah, <laughs> fair's fair. Is that a dig at me? <laughs> no, you've got a nice head of hair. Yours is lovely. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so Crawley, and this is what I want to get across. My mum and my dad got together when my mum was very young and impressionable. So my mum's two years younger than my dad. So my mum was 18 uh, when she had me. So we are best of friends. I love, I adore, I admire, like I love her to absolute pieces as I did and still do my nan. So the reason my dad managed to get his claws into my mum was because of the age my dad was, you know, he was the... He was the man about town in the day, massive personality, very confident, flamboyant, always the first on the dance floor. And he just got his claws into a very young, innocent girl, which was my mum. And uh, needless to say, they didn't last too long because as soon as my mum got the stamp of him, uh, like she was out. So I maybe had two years with... My mum and my dad in the same house. Then my dad got, uh, he got banged up. I mean, this podcast could go on for fucking hours because this story is hilarious. Yeah, that's cool. You'll like this one. Yeah. He got nicked for, well, he got, he got banged up. He got, I think he got, he got five and a half or six years for conspiracy to rob a post office. So him and his mate Spider, a guy called Adrian from Crawley, great big fucking geezer. Hands the size of your head. He's now he's now uh, no longer with us. Died of an overdose. But they planned to rob this post office. 
got the shooters, got it all planned, fucking criminal masterminds, like the Einsteins of <laughs> criminality. They've turned up to rob the post office. It's fucking closed. <laughs> <laughs> it's closed. And they got nicked for that because they conspired to do it and got a great big lump of bird. But my old man will never tell that story because it makes him look like the fucking, the, like the clown that he is. He likes to tell people he's a gangster. Yeah, I've done a six for armed robbery. It's like, no, no, no. You got a six for conspiring to rob a post office. And when you turned up to do it, it was closed. You didn't even have the brains to check the fucking opening times. So, uh, so yeah, so when I was two, he, uh, that was one of his first holidays that I was aware of. And then it was my mum and my nan that, that brought me up. And uh, I, went, I went from a few, a few different schools, as you can imagine. No father figure in the house. And still that little bit of influence my dad had on me when I used to go and visit. I would just always come out angry and violent. He just, that's the energy. Like not, you don't come out feeling revitalized and fresh and happy and you don't want to go and put love out into the universe like you just felt angry just <clears throat> it's just who he is it's just what he is he's filth so uh yeah done a few bit of school hopping had a great time loved school loved school too much thought it was a fucking thought it was a, a place of fun not a place to learn and i did have great fun and uh, become very close to my mum and my nan. Very much a mummy's and nanny's boy. Hence why I've always got a lot of love for women. In, uh, in the right sense, I'll open the door. I'll be polite. I'll treat you, you know, I'll, I'll treat you well. I'll be respectful. I'll try my best not to curse. Sometimes I can't control that. But I'll give it my best shot to be a gentleman. And I'm not too, I'm not overly keen on people. Never trust a man that, doesn't like women even if they've had their heart broken once you're not above heartache like still be respectful everybody gets their heart broken doesn't mean to say that you've got permission to go and walk the earth and just be horrible to women because you think they're all responsible so uh i'm very grateful in that department because i do know people that are very bitter towards women they're all this they're all that it's like fucking hell you're gonna put them all in the same bracket because you know one broke your heart like, take your medicine, man up, move on, go and find someone that you're more compatible with. So I had a lovely childhood, if I'm honest, a very, very lovely childhood. And I'm very grateful of all the love that was put my way. And like I say, mum and nan, wonderful human beings. And I would hate to think, I would hate to think where I would be today if it wasn't for them glorious human beings. And I tell my mum this every day. And the last words I said to my nan before she passed was, I love you. So that's another thing, another message that I'd like to fucking put out there. You love someone, you tell them. And it's a difficult thing for men. I think there's, I think there's a few things that I can only speak for men because I'm a man. Look somebody in the eye and say, I'm sorry. I'm wrong. I love you. I think a lot of people struggle to do that. Ego. Yeah. So if you love someone, tell them you love them. Because I tell you what, if I hadn't have said that to my nan before she went, it would have haunted me for the rest of my life. But I'm veering off now. We can, we can come back to that. So the childhood where I come from, Broadfields in Crawley, the anus of Crawley, few schools, got asked to leave politely, a few of them. I was a touch much. A lot of, uh, almost like I had testosterone in me when I was fucking young. And then my mum met a guy called Graham, my stepdad, who they're still together to this day. They've been together, what am I, 43 Fucking hell, where's that gone? Wow. 43. So they've been together 30 plus years. And I tell you what, he tolerated some, some heavy duty shit because we've not even got into the, my old man's behavior, his bully boy tactics, threatening him with fucking Reg Cray, Reg Cray ringing up the house, throwing acid over my mum's car, threatening to have a contract put out on my stepdad and, and my stepdad, I love him dearly. And if you're watching this, don't take this to heart. There is a bit of coward in you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's, uh, yeah, he'll be, the, he'll be the first to fucking, 
if there was an incident in the in in the high street, he'd be the first to wish he had trainers on so he could be on his toes. But he's a lovely man, and because he's not that way inclined, I respect him so much more because he stuck around when there was a lunatic uh, gunning for him. And no matter what you say about my old man, when I tell you some of the things that that that, that he's done, he's he's genuinely he's evil and his sister was the first to say that he's evil and I thought yeah yeah he's not he isn't just a head case or loose or a bully like he is like to, to do some of the things he's done which I'll tell you he is he's evil but then going back to the childhood mum got with Graham he lived in a different town which is sort of 15 minutes from Crawley called East Grinstead. Real interesting place. Got every different religion and cult you can imagine going on there in this small little town. Moved there. Different calibre of, like, because Crawley's a, a London overspill. So it's rough, it's ready, there's gangs, there's, you know, drugs getting shifted, people getting stabbed. And, you know, if anything like that happens over there, it's, it's, not, it's not shocking. We moved to East Grinstead, different world. Very nice, a lot calmer. School was great fun again. And that is about the that's the, the nuts and bolts of my childhood. It was it was great. In between me being a child and then going into my teenage years, going uh like to secondary school and finishing secondary school, my dad was in and out of jail, and so I would see him from time to time. He'd come out, I'd spend a bit more time with him, he it 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 go back to jail. He got a uh, he got a, an eight stretch for a million pounds worth of opium. Uh, I'm trying to be as respectful as possible and leave as many names out as I can. A, I don't like name dropping, and B, would they want me talking about their business? But I'm thinking, yeah, it's in the it's in the it's in the public domain anyway. It's in the media. It's out there. So. My old man done a deal with Joe Pohl Sr. Uh, I never knew him, never met him, because don't forget I'm like generations below, but heard nothing but good about him. So he must have kicked himself the day he got introduced to my old man, who is a low down piece of shit. But anyway, they done this deal, uh, million pounds worth of, worth of opium. One minute my dad's living in Burgess Hill, and also, whilst all, all my childhood's going on, my dad's in Parkhurst Prison. This is before the Isle of Wight become an island for nonces. Because, you know, the three nicks there, they're all, all for sex offenders now. Whereas before, you had like all the, all the heavy mob, all the gangsters. So if you was in jail back in the day and you was like, yeah, I've done a bit of bird in Parkhurst, you'd, you'd get a bit of respect for that. Yeah, it was a category of prison, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can't be 100% yeah. sure. So... Yeah, I won't say things I'm not 100% sure of, but yeah, I think it, 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 it was possibly proper, was. Yeah. yeah, but it was, there was, you know, Reg was in there for starters mm -hmm. and uh, my old man and him bunked up, become very, very close to the point of my old man become his power of attorney. He got all the royalties to the, to the film, to the books, uh, the sun printed in the newspaper, the, they were gay lovers. They then managed to sue the sun, uh, very open about the love for each other. My old man was on the first reality TV program called Survival. I think it was called Survival. Had Annabelle Croft was in there. This will it won't make you laugh, but it will it will make you think. Fucking hell, there's another person that's accused my old man of molesting them. Because when we get to the all the the juicy bits about that dog, and he's denied every single fucking allegation that's that's gone on, and it's always been somebody else's fault. It's like these allegations have been coming out since 1988. You went on a reality TV show called Survival, which was on TVS. Do you remember TVS? No. Yeah, it was fucking, it was years and years and years ago. But yeah, so the first, it was like I'm a celebrity, get me out of here. They all went out to a jungle. Uh, my old man was famous at the time for being Reggie's right-hand man, and he used to sing and play a guitar, and he had a single come out. Uh, and back in the day, you'd get your single, and it would go on the, like, on the shelf in the stores, and then depending on the pre-sales, then it would enter the charts. My old man got banged up while it's waiting to 
to see how many it, it sold. So again, another opportunity that he, I mean, he has fucked up some opportunities. This is how these narcissistic motherfuckers cannot control themselves because I've been in recording studios with UB40, with my old man, Jules Holland. Uh, fucking hell, who else is there? Roger Daltrey, Giza, the who are my favourite band. If Roger Daltrey was sitting there, I'd give him a cuddle, ask him if I can do anything for him and thank him for the hours of joy he's given me with his music and even his- The it, film? Oh, the, the McVicker. McVicker. Oh, mate. It's a classic. It's, yeah. I used to watch that with my dad back in the day. It's the one. Yeah. It's one of my absolute favourites. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, and I, 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 you know, I got on well with all of them because I was, you know, seven, eight, nine, little blonde haired, fucking chubby thing, cheeky chappy. And uh, my old man thought he was bigger than all of them people. So this is something that a lot of people won't know. So, you know, the film, The Craze, mm -hmm. I think it was Polygram that produced it. I'm sure, it was Polygram. Could be wrong, but it wasn't The Who Presents. So The Who Presents that done Quadrophenia. Uh, Possibly done, they done, they done McVicker, I'm not too sure. But anyway, the Who Presents were going to do the film. They were going to do the craze. My old man being Reggie's power of attorney, sticking his nose in everyone's business. Such a control freak. Freak. I mean, everyone likes to be in, in a certain element of control because it keeps you stable and you know where you are. But there's a line. It's like, you are a control freak and it's a serious illness. I mean, I didn't realise to the extent I was, I'm only a kid and what you see is what you know. You just think it's the norm, didn't you? Which is why not a great deal shocks me these days. He's on the phone to Roger Daltrey, lead singer of The Who, a big deal, a tremendous human being. Have some fucking respect. What? Hang about. <clears throat> Roger Daltrey here. <laughs> You want me to have some respect for a two bob wanker that couldn't even get the fucking post office times right when, <laughs> when you went to rob it? Uh, I don't think so, mate. Bye. So that was that. And the next day, so all, like, all these things my old man had going on, he was going to be in EastEnders. He had, he was in the paper. All you've got to do is like Google his name and you'll, you'll see he was in the paper near enough every day for quite a stint of time. All off the back of fruit and veg, mind. Nothing he'd accomplished himself, but nonetheless, you know, he put himself in a position. Fortune favours the brave. But what he didn't realise was that you've got to cling on to opportunities with both hands. And gratitude is the attitude. And he's got none of it. He's not grateful for anything at all. He thinks you should be grateful just by being in his presence. So when he's put the phone down, Sorry, when Roger Daltrey's put the phone down to my old man after fucking Pete Gillette, ex-con, living in Burgess Hill, the next day, every single door shut on my old man. All his, all his ties, all his connections, all his links, all his network, just boom, door shut. That's what you get for being a fucking egomaniac, you cretin. And... Yeah, thank God that did happen to him. It didn't humble him. It didn't humble him at all. He just threw mud at everyone and everyone was a slag and everyone was a wrong and everyone was against him. And then he tries to tell lies to Reg and make out he was going to sabotage the film. And it's like, fucking hell, Pete, change the record. You're a, you're a prolific, narcissistic liar. So I forgot why we even got onto this. Because there's so many things about him to rattle yeah. off I probably won't talk in straight lines because it comes back in different stages because he's done so many things and had so many opportunities and he's tried to destroy so many lives and he doesn't know where he is in the food chain. Imagine if you was interviewing Roger Daltrey. Thank you for coming on the show. I can't believe it's you. Wow. Fucking not my old man. You have some, <laughs> you have some respect. Oh, don't think so, mate. So yeah. So then the Who Presents no longer done the film. And then it switched to, to Polygram. That was the uh, that was the backstory behind that, which people may find interesting, that it was actually going to be the, the, the Who Presents that's in the film. 
And there's a scene in the film, The Craze, where my old man is in it because Reg said, I'll give you a part. And it's when Reg goes into the shop and Francis is in the car and then two blokes are looking at the car or looking at Francis and Reg comes out, uh, Martin Kemp, and says, uh, like, what are you doing? And it's the, the bloke that says, just looking at the car, mate. Don't see many around. They dubbed his voice as well. He hated that. <laughs> you can imagine, can't you? Fucking Mr. Ego himself. Fucking dubbed my voice. Couldn't believe it. It was an absolute liberty. And he got weighed in over the car. Have you said, do you remember that? Yeah, I remember, remember that from remember the, the with his sweets. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly that. Hmm. So That's the best craze for them. That was a classic. Brilliant, brilliant. And funny enough, I met, it is Martin Kemp, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. He, uh, great part he played. He, yeah, Both he, of them played great parts. Really, really good. Really convincing. Yeah, I bet you and me know it fucking pretty much line for line. Could be sitting here for the yeah. next two hours coming out with like mm -hmm. the one-liners. But he come to a club that I was working the door on years later. And uh, he was so nice, real humble, good to talk to. And then someone fucking said to him, oh, that's Peter's son. And I'm thinking, for fuck's sake. Just getting on, just getting on all right with this bloke here. Like, don't ruin it. And he says, "Oh yeah, he's Peter's son." And I know that no one liked my old man on that set because Charlie Cray, uh, like tongue in cheek, offered Martin Kemp a drink that when he's acting the part, like actually give him a proper dig. Like, no one likes him. Uh, but yeah, he was a real nice bloke. And then someone said to him, another doorman, because we had him out the back in the VIP, just about to bring him out. Oh. That's, that's Peter's son who was in the film and and I know he didn't like him do you know what he said he said, he said your dad was great he was really professional I knew it was lip service and it was bollocks but I thought what a nice bloke what he's just being he's being polite doesn't need to be and uh, yeah so that was that did you see what your dad was like at a young age or were you oblivious for it because it's kind of round all those people man that that's because I remember watching the craze in the 90s and going to school and me thinking I want to be like them just fucking crazy the fear obviously you get older and you start finding out what everybody's like and this and yeah. that you realise it's all bollocks but it was glamorous then did you see that with your dad are you oblivious to everything that he was doing and people were saying it, yeah if I'm honest because he was such a powerhouse of a character and he really was a power and I used to I've said to people you've got to be in a room with him to believe that that kind of human being exists it's hard to explain he's a fucking mutt that desire that deserves for his final breath to be now doesn't deserve to be on the planet but he is still an absolute force of nature and so i was in complete awe of him if i'm honest i'm in complete awe of him i i idolized him and don't forget we all it's human nature to want what you can't have. And as a kid, he was taken away from me a lot because he was always always back in jail. Uh, and I just thought it was it was just all normal to me. I, I didn't know any different. So, you know, having Reg as like a, a godparent and he used to ring the house up regularly. And when my dad was out, I'd go and visit Reg with my dad, sneak him in a bottle of whiskey. He'd sit there getting drunk and then he'd start, cutting off all the screws and then the visit would have to be cut early and he talks very quietly Reg as well so you've got to lean right into it when, he, when he's talking but yeah I just it, I, it didn't even occur to me that he's you know he's a he's a murderer just didn't didn't register I was in complete awe of my dad uh, and we sort of I think everyone loves to be loved and you it's like a bit a bit like a dog if you've got a dog that makes a big fuss of you or a kid, like automatically you respond and you, you know, you, you, you love them back in return. And where I had that from the likes of Reg, it was reciprocated. And my dad was just such a big force of nature. And he had all these people wrapped around him. And, you know, I, I knew that they was famous people because I would see him on the telly and yeah, it just seemed normal to me. And I didn't really realize just how dysfunctional he was. Uh, even when, even when my old man slept with Kate Cray, B, 
behind Ron's back. So Ron's wife, uh, do you remember she used to do Britain's Most Dangerous Men? So my dad slept with Kate Cray behind Ron Cray's back. Not many people would do that, would they? I mean, I know I certainly wouldn't. It's like, no, we get on great. Bit of chemistry there, but you are Ron's wife. I think I'm out. For that reason, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, but my old man being my old man thinks he's bigger and better than anybody else. And he's, uh, he's steam right in. In fact, he'd give a one in the passenger seat the vehicle that Reg bought him. Just the ultimate fucking liberty. And he's meant to be best mates with Reg. It's like you're... You're rumping your best mate's brother's wife. It's zero limits, no, no boundaries at all, like no code, just a pig. Uh, Ron found out. Ron then put a contract out uh, on my old man's head. I've been in, the, in his house listening to my dad on the phone, telling Ron that he's a fat puff and fat puffs don't threaten anyone, blah, blah, blah. Very much like Cornell was saying in the film, it was almost like listening to Cornell talking to, to Ron. My old man just didn't give a monkeys. Thought he was bigger and better than than anybody. My old man thinks... He must have had some set of balls. Well, he must have been a tough bastard to be standing up to the craze, especially the reputation they had then. It's funny you say that because I I consider my dad a coward. But he's clearly not. Uh, there'll be. He used to like to think that he you, that he would run Crawley and he was top boy around Crawley, but I know there's other faces in Crawley, for a fact that my old man, he would say that he would deal with if he needed to, but I know that he wouldn't. I know that his arsehole would fall out. So he's not. He's a bully. He's a coward and a bully. Or maybe when he was a lot younger, he was he had less fear. And he didn't care. Uh, he thinks he thinks the world is one big movie. He's centre stage and everyone else is an extra. And he truly believes that. He truly and utterly believes that everyone else is just an extra in his film and he's the main event. He's sitting in Albany jail now. And I've had Mal intercepted. He's playing judge and jury in there. He's deciding who's innocent, who's been fitted up, so that it sort of fits into his narrative of I've been set. You wait till we get to the point where I, I give you all the different reasons he's given and how, we, how he's telling people he's been set up for the fucking crimes he's done. Fucking blokes in there for 18 years. That's a sentence you get for like burying your kids under the patio. The, the, the trial was three weeks long. The judge just let it go on and on and on and on and on. Gets a unanimous guilty. Now nah, I've been set up. Fucking jury's been nobbled. Uh, CPS has been paid. The detective was fucking paid. Uh, People will believe him as well, in there. Oh, of course, they're all vulnerable, aren't they? And yeah. and, and they all, and yeah. and anyone in there that's absolutely banged to rights, they'll be delighted that someone is saying that they're innocent. Uh, but yeah, where was I going before we before we spoke about him being in Albany? Because we're shagging Ron's masses. Yeah, because we're sort of sorry, mate. That's yeah, okay, man. It's, it's perfect. Uh, because of the, the because there's so much he's done. Yes, yeah, to get it in chronological order, I should have come prepared with notes. No, no, this is the so, way it uh, should be. Yeah. Was he having an affair was your dad having an affair with Reggie? Were they in a relationship? Did that ever come out? Well, here's the thing. That was what was printed in the paper that they were that they were gay lovers. They openly said that they that they love each other. I mean, you and me have said that over fucking voice notes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we ain't had sex yet. Yeah. <laughs> it is still young, no, bro. No, no, fucking, I'm in no rush. <laughs> but, uh, but so it's never been proven. It's always been denied. And there's a story within a story here because as much as I would deny it, Back in the day to people because you know who yeah you know back then it was, right, it, then was very, it was very taboo you know now i've got you know i've got gay mates i went to dubai with one of my gay friends a, a few years back we booked it last minute we turn up i call him sue he'll like this i said sue there's one bed 
He said it was the only it was the, the only room I could get pet. I said, for fuck's sake. Massive great bit, it didn't matter. <laughs> we was only there four nights. So like I, I like I am like I've got no malice towards anybody. Any 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 race, fucking sexual preference, like if you're a piece of shit, you're a piece of shit, you're a good person, you're a good person. But back in the day, it was different. And you did not want your dad to be known as someone who's getting fucking served up by another bloke. So I used to I used to say no, it's all nonsense. And they did manage to sue the son for printing that they were in a sexual relationship. But now I know my dad. Now I know how he operates and how he functions. And now that we also know for a fact that, like a lot of lifers, Reg went with boys and Reg yeah. did end up sleeping with uh, with younger yeah. lads as well. Uh, there was that Bradley, wasn't there? So, do I think my dad and Reg had an intimate relationship? I honestly don't know. Do you think your dad was that fucking mad in his own ways of living that he manipulated him, even if it had to sleep with him to get ins to then get fame and attention? My dad would have manip manipulated Reg 100%. 100%. Uh, and I put nothing past him now. If this was before all the madness happened between me and my dad and then what I found out after I'd said about the things that he'd done to me, which are, which we've not covered yet, I would have stood up for him in certain areas. There was one thing that never added up about, about my old man. But go, going back to the question, I do think he's mad enough. I do think he's insane enough. And I do think he's evil enough to do whatever it takes to get whatever he wants. So for the record, I couldn't confirm either way whether they was in an intimate relationship or not. It's always been denied... And don't get me wrong, I fucking despise my old man as much as I still love him. Now that's fucked up when you think of all the stuff he's done. But you can't help how you feel, but you've got to manage how you feel. So the love has to be managed. He's a dog. He's a scumbag. He's a wrong person. Like, keep that love suppressed. Don't let it overwhelm what the reality is which he is a disgusting, despicable, uh, repugnant human being. And I would love to put it on record that, yes, my old man was getting rumped by Reg because he would hate it. But the truth sets us free, so I can't come on here and tell Fibs just to score brownie points. So I don't know, but I wouldn't put it past him because since I've learned how he operates... There's nothing I would put past him at all. He, he has no limits. He has no filter. He has no boundaries. He has no morals, no respect. He's just, yeah, he's, I'm trying to work out. I mean, he's, he's of course, he's a, he's a sociopath and I'm just, I'm trying to, I've always, I've always, I'm trying to work out, is he a psychopath? There's a difference between the two. Uh, yeah, so I don't know. When did you feel the negatives towards your dad? The older I got, well, I'll tell you how it all started. This is the best. The, the best shift is, because then this sort of can be in chronological order. So he got sentenced. This was the Joey Pyle uh, opium deal. This is when I, I realised that he was a liar. And to be a liar a lot of people won't realise this. I bet there'll be a lot of people watching this that do tell lies. And if they're honest with themselves and they have an honest conversation with themselves, and you've got to be honest with yourself as well, and you probably won't like the answer nine times out of ten, but if you're completely honest with yourself, there'll be people out there that tell lies. They'll pretend they don't because they're lying again. <laughs> yeah. so they're like, wow, this is a vicious circle of lies and you're in prison. I've told a couple of lies before in the past. They meant nothing either. They were silly little lies to sort of big myself up like in my teenage years. And because I told it once or twice, I had to keep telling it. One day I, I come clean, said to my mate in the pub, I said, Shane, I've got to tell you something now. I said, you know what I said I'd done? 
basically I, I made out that I'd slept with a with a with, with a bird on holiday in Ibiza just to get my numbers up. I was seventeen. We've all been there, and I said I didn't sleep with that. I didn't sleep with that woman. He went fuck yes. Yeah, I said I said I promise you, mate. I said I didn't sleep with her, and I said but the fact I've lied about it, it's felt heavy on me. I don't want to feel heavy no more. I don't want to live with a lie hanging over me. So I know the damage a lie can do to someone. So if you're a prolific liar, you've got to be pretty fucking cooked in the head. And you, you're in your own psychological jail, isn't you? You're, you're locked in your own headspace. So I learned that my dad was a prolific liar when he got the eight years for the, for the Joey Pyle uh, I say the Joe Paul because he's he's the most prominent name that people will people will be aware of and and they'll know. Uh, he got eight years. Joey Paul got fourteen. There was a few other people that got uh, other lumps. Uh, it was all they was all under surveillance. There was undercover police involved. Uh, the jury got nobbled, so the, the the trial had to restart. New jury. Uh, and this is not me coming out with anything new. Because also, I'm not about that. If uh, if no one knows and I know, that's where it stays. You, I, I'm good at keeping a secret. But this is out in the public domain. So while my old man's on remand, and even while he's doing his sentence, and I'm young, he looked me in the eye on a number of occasions. And he said, Liam, I've been fitted up. I didn't do it. I swear on your life. May you drop down dead with cancer. I did not do it. It's a fucking pretty heavy duty statement to make. Fair dues. I believe you didn't do it. Who would say that? You could say a million things. I swear to God. You're never going to meet the man probably, so <laughs> why not swear on his life? Why me? <laughs> <laughs> and, why, 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 why like wish me dead of cancer if you're yeah. lying? <laughs> When you fucking know you are, because <laughs> guess what appeared on Scotland Yard about like eight, nine months later, bold as brass, clear as day, just as that camera there, Peter Gillett, two bags of opium in a car park outside a hotel from one vehicle into the other, bang to rights. You fucking dog. You've, you've looked your son in the eye and said, I am, I didn't do it. And if I'm telling a lie, may you drop down dead with cancer. That resonated with me on, on, a, on a huge level, a monumental level. I thought, wow, that is, that's not just sinister or dark. That's fucking, that sick, twisted and evil shit. You just wouldn't say that. You'd say anything but that, wouldn't you? So that's when I, that's when I knew that he was a, he was a sociopath. And a, and, a, and a prolific liar. And also there was another thing that stuck with me, which again, I learned because he's made similar accusations about me and my friends. Funny enough, I won't mention names, but I watched one of your podcasts a few years ago and you had someone on here, but I'm watching it and my jaws drop in and I'm thinking, this geezer reminds me of my old man. Fuck. Now, Anybody that, well, they don't even cross my dad. My dad decides they've done something wrong. Falls out with everybody. Do you know what my dad does if he doesn't like someone? Or I'll give you an example. He didn't get invited to someone's wedding. Now, my dad's not a straight goer. He's never worked an honest day in his life. Lazy, work shy, bit of shit. Never worked an honest day in his life. And this guy that he knew, nice, normal, straight going bloke. He befriended my dad because he liked the idea of, you know, he was impressed by all that old bollocks. Me, I, that's the one thing I've, that, that, that I've taken from all of this. I don't fear no one and none of that impresses me. It's like, you want to live that life, that's good for you. That don't impress me. You have to sleep with fucking one and a half eyes open yeah. <laughs> every night. Both of mine close at night because I fly straight. But he liked the glitz and the glamour of what he thought was impressive, you know, Pete Gillette, Reggie Cray's right hand man in with Jules Holland and fucking Roger Daltrey and blah, 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 and this, that, and the other. So that's why they had a, a bit of a friendship. 
they weren't best of friends by any stretch of the imagination. My dad didn't get invited to his wedding. If you met my dad for 30 minutes, you'd understand why. The cunt would think it was his wedding. Straight up. <laughs> um, he'll be standing there, honestly, he'll be, he'll be standing there saying, thanks for coming, everyone. <laughs> like, no, mate, it's not your day. Like, sit down. Uh, there's another story in a minute I'll tell you about him, blow your mind. But anyway, this guy that didn't invite him to his wedding. So all of a sudden, they're really good friends, so much so that my dad wants to go to his wedding, doesn't get invited to his wedding. Next thing, he's telling everybody he's a nonce, he's a sex case, he's a rapist. He's this, he's that. Don't trust him. I'm telling you, on my mother's life, he's a sex case, he's a wrong'un. I thought, fucking hell, that's a serious accusation to make. And if you knew that, what the fuck did you want to go to his wedding for? And I noticed this habit with him. Anyone he fell out with was a nonce or a wrong'un or a rapist. Every, every person he fell out with, he spread the same rumours about them to people to the family, to friends, to their friends, to their family. So you can imagine how dangerous he was when, once he realised that he could spread these messages about people on the internet. Oh, Christ. I got off lightly compared to some people before me and him uh, went to war online. If he fell out with somebody, he was tarnishing them with the most heinous accusations. And now I've got to understand the little pleb, which is all he is, pff, minion. Uh, He's projecting. Yeah. He's self-projecting on people. I didn't know this because I didn't realize that my old man was all of them things. He accuses everyone of being who he is. Wow. I mean, that's that's not just audacious. That's fucking off the, off the Richter scale, isn't it? That is, that is some front. Knowing that you're guilty of all them things, but throwing them accusations out. When you know that there's someone out there that can say, actually... Peter done that to me, which eventually happened thanks to my live feed. Uh, so, yeah, prolific liar. What was the question you asked? Sorry, mate. Just to how you were, when did you realise the negatives? You started saying about... Oh, the negatives, yes. You started saying you found out about his lies, it swears in your life. You do well to remember what you asked when I go off yeah, on a fucking... That's beat. why <laughs> I'm the best when, when, when I go off on a tangent, even yeah. I think, well, what, what, did, what did James ask me? So, yeah, so I realised the negatives when he would always... He'd always be bad-mouthing somebody in a, in, a, in, a, in a severe manner. And, I mean, yeah, it's documented. I the only person I've ever really bad mouthed online is my old man. I'd, so, I, you know, I, my job is to build people up, not crush them down. And if I fall out with somebody, you sometimes have to sit and think to yourself, well, was I part of that problem? Did I do anything that could have been different? You won't get that from him. So I realized the bad in him when he would lie about people. Uh, he thought he was, far more superior than anybody and some of the things he's done to my mum as well and I don't really want to talk about my mum too much because I don't want her being involved in this because she's so timid she's I mean me and her we're, we're our hearts are in line but she's introvert very very kind sweet she's just glorious mate she's a hell of a woman and how she got involved with my dad is unbelievable when she got up and testified against him in court, I hate to use the word like I'm proud of you. I think it's, I think it's a patronizing term, but especially like being proud of your mum should be the other way around. But I was so proud that she, she had the stones to do that because she's always been scared of him. So again, does that upset you? Uh, it infuriates me. It infuriates me. And this is how I know that he's not quite the lunatic he makes out because I've switched on him in the past. But when we get to the bit when when I sort of remind you of my first, uh, the, the, the big reveal of the things he'd done to me, why didn't he come knocking on my door, this big gangster? Why did he revert to, oh, I'm going to come back on the internet and make my own edited video? I'd go live every time. This ain't rehearsed. I'm telling you the truth. Anyone's, anyone can comment and ask me and, I, and I'll respond. And that was, my whole, that was my whole purpose when we was online going back and forth of, you know, <clears throat> me 
accusing him of the things that he's done. And let me tell you, what he's, what he's been to jail for is only the half of it. If he'd, have, if he'd have got sent to jail for all the things he's done, because witnesses pulled their statements and decided not to not to go ahead because he was threatening to throw acid in their face and to people that know that he probably would do that. Again, that's about as much as I can say about that because if it's not my story, I can't tell it. Uh, although you may get you may get other people off, off the back of this that think, you know what, I want to add to that and you'll get more interesting uh, stuff from the, from the demon. Uh, I've lost my thread again, James. Sorry, yeah, no, when you're going through all that and your mum had to go to court. Yes. So my mum went to court. So before that, when they don't know, oh yes, the things he's done to my mum. Oh, he put a knife up, up to her throat and she was pregnant with my younger brother who's 10 years younger than me. Uh, when my mum had a miscarriage, uh, he left a, a voice note. A vo Back in the day, it was like answer machine, wouldn't it? You get home. You have seven messages, all boom, play. Those were the days, weren't they? And uh, one of them was my old man laughing manically, absolutely delighted that my mum had had a miscarriage. And then when she fell pregnant again with my younger brother, I hope he's born a spastic. Why would you hope anybody was born a spastic? Why would you hope that my mum's child was born a spastic? She's done nothing to you. My mum's done nothing to anybody. She's the kindest person I know. Doesn't like conflict, doesn't like arguments. Just, I've said it once, I'll say it until I'm blue in the face. A glorious, wonderful human being, as was my nan. And it's thanks to them I kept on the straight and narrow because if, if it was for him, God, God knows where I'd be. Just just the little, little snippets of time that I spent with him when he was in and out of jail, uh, was enough to do some damage. Does that scare you to think that if he never got the jail for that robbery where he fucked the times up and he spends more time with you at how you could have been as an individual and not having that loving support from your nan and your mum? I'm more... Yeah, see, I'm more... F the way I perceive things is I'm more... I always go the other way. I'm not... I'm not fearful of what could have been I'm just extremely grateful of how it went. Yeah. Because if it had have gone the other way and he had more impact, more influence on me, then yeah, I mean, he wanted he wanted to me he wanted me to be a drug dealing fucking bully boy. I mean, 100% and he done some I didn't even realize that he that he was abusive towards me until someone actually highlighted it. I've got pictures actually on my WhatsApp, which I'll forward to you. Yeah, we can put them up if you want. Yeah, pff, you'll, you'll get it taken down. I'll, I'll tell you what they are. So, and also my old man's got a little band of merry men and none of them seem to think that what he's done is a problem. When I tell you about him jumping in a in a 13 year old girl's bath, no one seemed to think that was a problem. Uh, when there's pictures of me and him on his second honeymoon, he took me on his honeymoon and there's pictures of me and him in a swimming pool uh, with our whole bodies raised and like with my shorts pulled down below my knees. So my little, you know, my little bald willy is poking above the, the surface and my dad's next to me doing exactly the same thing. Now, it doesn't take Sherlock Holmes to work out who encouraged who to do that. And someone's taken a photograph of it. These I've got and, uh, and I will give you. And it was these pictures that someone said to me when I found them in a box forgot they even existed. You do know that's abuse. And I'm like, yeah, that is, that is abuse. Fuck me. I'm in a, I'm in a swimming pool in Spain on his honeymoon and he's pulling his swimming trunks down, exposing his cock and balls, raising them above sea level, getting me to do the same so someone can take pictures. And there's a few of them. That made me sad. That made me sad because I couldn't change that. It happened and it was there. And it's it was documented via photograph so I can see it, relive it, and just think that was an innocent play. Because also on his honey on the same honeymoon, so now we, we got I'm, I'm going back in time again. So sorry about all the all the, the timeline okay. the timeline That's hopping. Okay. Remember I said to you there's so much that this could take like four podcasts yeah. to get through. It's because he's done so much I forget. So I went on his honeymoon. 
every afternoon they'd have a siesta. They'd have a siesta. The door would be left open. He'd be having sex with his second wife. I'll be walking around the villa. I can see him having sex. Why would you leave the door ajar? That's a deliberate stunt. The deliberate thing would be to fucking shut the door, lock it, if you're that keen to fucking like ravage your new wife and you can't help yourself because your young son's there, shut the door, lock the door, keep it quiet. Fucking door wide open, hammer and tongs. And I'm a young kid walking around like looking at that and that made me feel very awkward. I, I, I remember even now I can sort of relive the feeling in here. That was awkward. But again, you get desensitized to things and sort of it becomes the norm and it's like, oh, it's, you know, by, by the end of the, the honeymoon, oh, siesta time. Oh, this, is, this is where the old man rumps Gerald in again. And I'm not tired. Like what fucking, what nine-year-old or how, however old I was, like as a siesta on holiday. It's like, yeah, I'm not an old man. I'm like a young lad, bedtime, sort of seven, eight, nine on holiday. So that's another, that's another thing he'd done. Uh, he gave her a clump on the same honeymoon in front of me, which scared the daylights out of me. And I'd like never seen a, would never seen a, a woman treated like that before. Cause I was, cause I was raised by women. I thought women were the, you know, were the strongest, you know, p pillars of society. Like you, you don't fuck with women. And then bam, like core. Cool. And then I'm too scared to say anything or do anything. And then he's taken me into, into wherever we were in Spain, into some town. And I remember him. Do you know why he gave her a clump? Because she spoke Spanish and he didn't know. We went into a, sorry, he's come back to me. The reason why. Yeah, it's all right giving you the story, but like without some context. So we went to wherever we went in Spain, like a restaurant or maybe even a bar. Uh, and we're sitting there and she started, spoke Spanish to the waiter. And because my dad didn't know that she could speak Spanish, fuming, bubbling, 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 gets back to the villa, bam, clumps her, then goes back out to score a bit of puff. So that's the sort of dog we're dealing with. Now, if I went to Spain with my missus, who does a lot of things that amaze me, by the way, and she started rattling off Spanish in front of me. I say, like, fucking hell. Wow. Fair play. You kept that from me. That's awesome. Now teach me how to say, you know what I mean? Yeah. But yeah, not him, because just that megalomaniac, control, narcissistic, filthy, don't keep things from me. It's like, yeah, this, you know, she's, she's not had an affair. She's obviously been speaking a bit of Spanish long before you come along and they was married within I think weeks as well so it's not like they had a great deal of time to get to know each other so that was another that was another moment where I realized I was scared of him if I'm honest uh what did people used to say to you about your dad was it all positive or was there anybody ever come forward and say look nah they love so all my friends thought he was great because well, I can, I'll, I'll skip to the bit where he basically fed us all drugs. So you can imagine. Uh, now, my mum and my nan would always be worried. They would always be very, very worried about him because they knew what he was all about. And he would always, you know, it, it'd always be threatening you with something. There'd always be some kind of threat. And, you know, it was clear as day who he was wrapped around with, who, who, who he was associated with. He built up a big network in jail and he always had, you know, he always had someone wrapped round him with a fucking nose like that and a great big Mars bar down his face like fucking seven foot tall. So, of course, if he says, you know, if this happens and, and he'd have paint stripper thrown on my mum's car and it'd always, be up, it'd always be up to something. But you have to remember during all, all of this, my mum is not one of them women. She's not neurotic. She's not a problem. She never, ever stopped him from seeing me. In hindsight, she should have done, but she didn't agree with that. And I respect and love her for it. He's my father. It's his right to see you. She kept a close eye on it, as close as she could. But don't forget, my dad, master manipulator, mm -hmm. got in my head. So this is why my friends 
ended up liking him. So I now think I was 15. I thought a few years back I was either 14 or 15. But the more I think about it, I was probably 15. 1995, I was born in 1980. But I had friends, uh, my friend Nick, who come and testified, Sergeant Major in the Army for 14 years, very credible human being, outstanding man. Uh, he was a year younger than me at school. But we would all go to my dad's house. I mean, this is where my dad was completely banged to rights in the trial. This was, I think this charge was child cruelty, or something, something like that. There must have been maybe 10 friends all in all. I mean, talk about doing things in plain sight, but that's what he done. And that's what all of these narcissistic fuckers do. The Jimmy Savills, they do it all in plain sight, all blase. And then it gets to a stage where he does outrageous things. And it's like, oh, you know, it's, it's, it's Peter. You know, that, that's what he does. He used to take me to watch the Arsenal. Again, another memory's come back. He used to take me to watch the Arsenal and he'd rush me in the toilet if I needed to go, if I needed to go for a piss. He'd come behind me, un undo my trousers, pull my pants down, hold me cock while I'm taking a piss. He'd hold me cock for me, shake me dick, put it away. I think it's normal. It's my dad taking me to the toilet. Knew no different. And I'd actually forgot that he'd done that until another friend of mine, who he used to take to Arsenal as well, which was one of his best friend's son, same age as me, I won't mention his name, uh, but he was also prepared to come to court to give a statement, but it wasn't necessary. He said to me, yeah, your dad, when we go to the Arsenal, we'd take me in the toilet and he'd do this and he'd pull me knob out. And I said, fucking hell, he used to do that to me. I said, I totally forgot he even done that. That was one of the things that I forgot he'd done. But it, he just done it in such a way that it felt normal. But that's not normal. Like we know that's not normal, and I and I know that's not normal now. So that's another thing he done. I just jumped back in time there because I was younger then. So why my why my friends liked him? Because he treated them all like adults. So we'd go around his yeah, he was in our halfway homes before, once he'd come out of the shovel, uh, before he ended up renting a a flat in West Green, Sunnymead. Anyone from Crawley will know these flats in Sunnymead. Now they do haunt me. Now I'm always the glass is half full, but there's a certain there's a certain part of my life, childhood, which is haunting because I got introduced to drug induced anxiety. Like well, I've got a feeling you know that vibe. It's very, very scary. And when I tell you some of the things he used to do to me in a minute, it'll fucking, you'll think, wow, he is evil. So my friends liked him because we'd all go around there. He'd be rolling joints and he'd have a, he'd have a little pipe with solid, you know, we're 15, 14, school kids, impressionable. This is my dad, the big character, Reggie Cray's right-hand man. He's in the film. I mean, now we know, like a small part in a film, it's not worth a wank, but <laughs> <laughs> at, the t at the time when you're a kid, you think your dad's a movie star, didn't you? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we all had him on a pedal stool and he all treated us like adults. And that's why my friends liked him. Uh, so we would go around there, we'd all be smoking, smoking dope with him. That's how it started, smoking the puff with him. Uh, even had a friend in in the high street one day sort of pull him in front of me. He was a he's passed away now. He was a he was a pro boxer at the time, and he said, "Oh yeah, you know we're going back for a puff." And he's looked. He said, well, "You're going back for a puff." He's like Peter. He's you know he's a kid. Oh, he fucking loves it. He's old for his age. Or he come out with some spin. Can spin anything, my old man. He really can. To the point, I had a screw when I had I can't remember what one of my accounts before it got unpublished. He sent me an inbox saying, I was in uh, I was in Lewis when your dad was in there on remand or whenever it was in there. He said, he is a very, very manipulative man. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, no shit. <laughs> I'm acutely aware of that. But uh, he said, yeah, he goes, I, I couldn't message you at the time because it was a conflict of interest. <clears throat> so people cotton on to him. So I started smoking puff, all of us together. Then it went to amphetamine. In fact, let me go back quickly. Another 
thing he'd done. When he lived in Burgess Hill, so I was a lot younger, he'd have these late night drug parties. Even when I, so even when I would, I'd, I'd go around there, that didn't stop him. He'd still be up, like men, women there, all fucking, all, all cracking on, out there nuts. And I think back then it was more ease that they were into. But they'd just be playing porn like it was Coronation Street. So I'd come down in the morning, there'd be people sprawled out all over the gaff with porn running. You remember back in the day, you'd get VHS mm -hmm. and you'd, you'd put it on long play. You'd get an eight hour tape, fucking eight hours worth of porn just playing on repeat. And I'd come down and watch that and see these people spangled out their nuts. And I was a kid, I was young. He just didn't think to, just press stop, Peter. You're going to bed now, you've got your kid here. Like, just press stop on the video. You don't need pornography fucking playing. But that's just the dog he is. So that was that. Sorry, jumping forward again, because I'm now thinking about his partying antics. Because this is when he'd done some damage to me. Up until this stage now, you know, he'd, he'd done a few things to me mum, and but he was still my dad, and I, you know, still loved him, and he was in and out of jail as well, so I never really got to know him properly, and I'd only see him in like little snippets of time. And then when the drugs escalated, and this is the scary bit, this actually I look back with a bit of fear and think, oh, yes, I'm extremely grateful that didn't happen, but it was that close to what I was just touching base on uh, be before we, we, we started rolling. Started smoking puff together with my friends. Then we started doing amphetamines together, again with my friends. So this is when he's in court telling it, saying that everyone's a liar and it's all a big fucking stage and a setup. And it's like, Pete, there's about 10 witnesses to this one, mate, all, all independent, like, kids at the time that could describe your flat tell you tell you like even what the puff was it was rocky that we were smoking or soap bar like everyone knew what we were smoking then you was getting the amphetamines in so we're sitting up whizzed off our heads and for a young brain that's still at school that hasn't even properly developed yet that is so much stuff going in and such an intense environment with him because there's no filter with him he doesn't change he's as aggressive he's as forthcoming he's as dominant he's as controlling he's as despicable around a seven-year-old than he is a 40-year-old so after the amphetamine we'd sit up all night and then he'd, he'd go to bed he'd take uh tamazepan or valium and put himself out and i'd be fucking laying there for hours face tingling and twinging and I just remember sort of staring in the mirror and that there'd be porn on. I'm 15 years of age, mate, around my dad's house. You know, not only monkey see, monkey do, if your dad's doing it, it's surely it's okay. It, when you grow up, you realize, fucking hell, that's not okay. You, you should be swinging from a tree. In fact, it should be a public hanging just for that. Then it shifted to ecstasy. So we're all sitting around his house, taking ease with him. Then the speed's coming out. Then these drug cocktails. Then he introduced me to acid. Whew. Have you done acid? Yeah. Yeah. Trapping balls, man. Because it's one of them ones in it that people our age, like we was, a, we sort of luckily, well, I didn't luckily, but a lot of people my age, like they never done it because it was more like in the, like in the Happy 70s. The 70s, yeah, yeah, all the hippy dippy stuff. But when I tell people about acid, and I and I mean this wholeheartedly, you could put an acid tab there, a purple microdot or an om or whatever the fuck, and you could have a million pound in cash. You do that microdot, that million pounds yours. I couldn't do it. I wouldn't do it. I would be scared out of my wits, but I would never ever come back from it because the damage that the LSD done to my mind as a young boy with my dad's behavior thrown into the mix. So we weren't taking acid all sitting around going, chilling, hmm, yeah. like chilling out and talking about love and life and, you know, positive stuff and affirmations and fucking talking about furniture and feng shui. My old man was talking gangster and he could see that I was having a funny turn on it. And when you have a funny turn on it, it's the scariest thing I've ever experienced in my life. And I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. 
the paranoia, the hallucinations, the complete loss of your mind and the fear, and you don't even know what you're scared of. And my dad would sit there in front of my friends and out of the blue, he'd say, he'd say, what'd you say? I said, I said what do you mean? He said, no, you, you, you just fucking said something. I said, no, I didn't. He said, no, you just fucking said something, you cunt. What did you fucking say? You fucking said something. He would go on and on and on. I don't even like reacting it because it, 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 it's cringeworthy me doing what he used to do, but so you get the full effect. Yeah. He'd get right in my face as I'm freaking out on LSD as a 15 year old child. What did you fucking say, you cunt? I didn't say anything, Dad. And he'd go, ah, fucking mug, slap me on the leg, gotcha. <laughs> See him fucking shit himself, didn't he, the cunt? It's like, wow, you sick, twisted motherfucker. But I'm just too scared out of my wits and like fr frozen with fear, thinking I'm losing my mind here. Like my dad is switching on me for no reason because he found it funny. And all my friends are around him, none of them found it funny, but everyone laughed out of nerves. That's the sort of thing he would do to me. Psychological bullying. That is traumatic. That's heavy. So that time I spent in that flat in Sunnymead, that's the sort of shit I was subjected to. They weren't nice times with my father. We weren't doing any kind of normal bonding. We weren't sitting there watching films, uh, playing Rummy Cub or Monopoly or listening to fucking Fleetwood Mac. He's pumping me full of mind altering drugs and switching on me and leaving porn on and belittling me. And then on my 16th birthday, after we'd been up fucking all night long, he's come in, come in the bedroom and then told me that I'm now going to move in with him. Oh, mate, it was terrible. He went into graphic detail about our life's going to change now. You're a man. It's like, fucking, I'm 16 still. I was, I, was, I was 15 yesterday, fucking spangled on acid, and you were switching on me. This morning, you're going to come over him and me. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. You're like, you're fucking your shit cunt mother. And, it, and I mean, he, he said that a few years later, and I switched on him. And I've, he looked about as scared as I was when he switched on me. So I know he's a coward. But at the time, I was still in absolute panic come down, spaced out, whatever it is on that shit, which is why you would never catch me doing fucking that again. So that's another thing he done, which was extremely evil, uh, which I'll never forget, which is when I went to the police in the end, uh, that was one of the things I said that he would, you know, he would give me class A drugs. Uh, another thing he done, which he got a guilty for, he, he'd always walk around with an erection as well. He'd always walk around in front of me with a hard-on. And again, he'd explain in the morning when you're a man, you wake up, you need a piss, you get a hard-on. It's like, okay, bit weird. My stepdad doesn't do that in front of me. But if this is how it is, this is how it is. So I sort of got a bit normal to that. And when he lived in this, in this halfway house, when he come out of come out the boob to get weighted to be housed somewhere else or rent somewhere, he used to hop around these little bed sits and we'd have to sleep in the same bed. He'd have one double bed. So we're sleeping in bed one day. This is, this is a, another thing that he got guilty for. I fucking look right in, in the morning and he's fucking sitting there playing with, with his hard cock in front of me. Now this did make me feel awkward and I sort of recoiled and he obviously sensed that and then mooded, he was scratching his leg. So I, I didn't imagine that because this is when I was very young. But like, I wasn't on mind altering drugs back then. This was um, of sound mind, like very aware of my surroundings, what's going on to the point where that's making me feel very uncomfortable. Fucking, you got your, your hard cock in your hand, sort of shaking it about. And I look in the same bed as me. You could tell I felt obviously extremely uncomfortable about it. I couldn't hide it. And then he sort of rubbed his leg and, you know, tried to style it out. Then he's got up, gone to the toilet. Uh, but I never give it, I never give it another thought. I never give it another thought because I, I was desensitized to all of his dysfunction. And so when I went to the police, after I put a live feed out saying all the things he'd done. Yeah, how did that start? Because when, when I watched your videos, it was all fun and 
yeah. positivity. Like, what was the moment for you to jump on a live? Like, how did that start? Right. So this is how we call it a feud began. Because I remember, sorry for interrupting, but he was trying to copy your videos as well. Because I remember you saying a video yes. up that he was... And it never made sense. I just thought it was a bicker. I didn't realise the depth. Yes. But I seen just... That was like... Because I can remember fucking... It's mad that I can remember that shit. Yeah. And now you're sitting here... And it, do you know what? It, it makes it... Because this is the first time I've ever, I've ever spoke to someone that I've not known my entire life about it. Mm -hmm. It sort of makes it easier. And I can connect with you because you do remember that. Yeah. Because there's a lot of people that didn't see the goings on. And anyone that, that watched it watched the whole, let's call it a feud, an internet feud, back and forth with the videos. They saw it clear as day. He was banged to rights. I'm telling the truth. I had no, there was no reason for me to lie. It all went against me. I'm trying to live a nice, normal life and run a business and it consumed me. How I managed to keep hold of my business is, excuse me, is, is beyond me. It was so consuming. Because I remember and, you used to do videos saying you're not going to do anymore, but then somebody else would come forward. Yes. And then you would talk about them. This is a it was so fucking mad. Mm. I was going through mad shit at that time, genuinely. And I thought, it actually made me feel better. I'm sorry. I was going to say, yeah. I actually thought, my life, I'm just going through a few addiction issues and yeah. other shit that was going on, but it wasn't as in depth. Then other names started getting involved. And then I think other people started doing lives. It was just, it was messy. It was incredible how many people got involved that didn't have the first idea. Let me go back to how it started when how, why I first done my live, but just, just bookmark this. DJ Sally Dixon. Anybody watching this, Google DJ Sally Dixon. It's the piece of shit that identifies as a woman, but a man, got sent to a woman's jail, it's all in the newspaper, got banged up for nonce in his kids. Friend of my dad's back in the day, jumped straight on my dad to my dad's defense when I made these allegations. Well, when I basically stated the, the, the facts and the truth of what took place. He jumped straight to my dad's offense, uh, defense, had him on his radio show. Uh, and they're sort of talking about me like I'm, I'm this fucking uh, Walter Mitty character and none of it ever happened. And Peter is whiter than white and as if he would do that and he's a great bloke. And I'm thinking, fucking, who is this DJ Sally Dixon? This DJ, it's another thing that a couple of my dad's friends, well, not friends, people that knew my dad years ago. And don't forget, my dad spent most of his life in prison. So they knew my dad 30 years ago. Then they rekindled their relationship 30 years later through the internet. But yet they're telling people, oh, I've known Pete 30 years. It's like, no, no, no. You met him 30 years ago and you've re-met him now. In those 30 years, what the fuck do you know about him? Zero. And that's what this DJ Sally Dixon was saying about me. Oh, I've known Liam since he was boom, boom, boom. I managed to get on the radio show, pretend that I was somebody else. Yeah, Dixon. Yes, Liam Peterson. Uh, don't put the phone down. You've just let my dad sit there and talk on your fucking poxy radio show about me. So I'm now going to talk to you. Firstly, I want to clear one thing up. You said you've known me 30 years. Can you confirm what you mean by that? Uh, no, no, no. Confirm what you mean by that. Well, you, you, you come round uh, Jackie Brown's house uh, when you were seven and you loved your dad. I said, so you met me once when I was seven. Uh, can we, can we confirm that? Yeah. Right. And because I'm now 37 and you've seen me on the internet, you're telling people you've known me 30 years. You fucking moron. You've met me once when I was seven. Of course, I'm going to look, look at my dad, you know, like he's my hero. I'm seven. The age could be slightly out, but you get the gist. Mm. So you've got these low-level intelligent people, and obviously now we know that birds of a feather stick together. We've got these filthy dog rat pieces of shit that all seem to think that nonsense is okay. Of course he's going to jump to my dad's offence, but DJ Sally Dixon, you'll be interested in, if, if that doesn't ring a bell, it was, a, it, it was quite a big story, and it was brilliant when I found out that not only has he been nicked, he's been investigated, he's been charged, then he's been birded off. It's like, thank God for that.
because it's horrible when people are against you because people believe them as well yeah and that's the hard thing when you're trying to speak the truth did it ever make you stop and think mm, this is maybe a bit too much and to back off brother on my mother's life i said this from day one i said i'm going to commit to this and if i lose everything not when it was just my the things that he'd done to me so just to be clear, the things he'd done to me, because my old man liked to then put out on the internet that I'd accused him of raping me. I'd never said that. Oh, the, the boy that cried rape, he would go and he'd take the piss out of me. So he would lead people to believe that I've said that he raped me. I, I didn't say that. I didn't say that at all. I said that he used to suck my tongue, which he did, which I then thought was was normal. Your dad's sucking your tongue. And then he'd say... He would go on there with a fucking Buddha. Yeah, <laughs> fucking the, the, the Dalai, Dalai Lama. Lama. Yeah, it's like fucking hell, Dalai meet Pete. There you go. Get your tongues out, lads. Get your tongues out for the lads. Yeah, so so that was weird. So he, he used to like suck my tongue or put his tongue in my mouth. I can't remember the fucking sequence, you know, I'm a kid. But yeah. when I mentioned that, my old man's response was, I've been talking to a man of medicine, a doctor, and he says that for me to suck your tongue, you had to put your tongue in my mouth. Is that what you've done, you dirty cunt? So he's saying that over the internet to me, trying to twist it. It's like, no, you used to put your tongue in my mouth. I thought that was normal. So I then put my tongue in your mouth. You fucking filthy animal. Because I thought that was the norm. I didn't think there was anything wrong with not putting your tongue in your dad's mouth because you showed me that, you fucking pig. But you always twisted it round. He even blamed me as a nine-year-old for getting in this 13-year-old girl's bath. He's like, oh, fucking hell, the nine-year-old gets the blame, does he? So, yeah, where was I? Oh, yeah, so I come out with with, with my bits and pieces So to confirm. What made you come out, though? We had a, another row, because every time I would get remotely close to him, we would have another fallout, because he... What's the best? If I was Peter, and you're you and I was to come on your show, I'd be very grateful. Thanks for having me. Really enjoyed my time. I wish you the best of luck. Let's stay in touch, and I want to watch you fucking blossom and grow and take over the world. I want you to be a multi-millionaire, have the biggest family. Good luck to you. Then we'd go and we'd keep in touch. My old man would come on your show. He'd then look at who else you've been speaking to. He'd go back through all of your guests. He'd then contact them. Yeah, I didn't like this about James. What do you, what do you think? Boom, 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 boom. Oh, yeah, I suspect this about James. Mate, before you know it, he's weaving in your network and your circle and he's trying to turn everybody against you. For what reason? I don't know. I can only assume it's jealousy because any time he saw me do well, you could see it in his face. He turned up on my, on my, uh, on my doorstep one day which was fucking horrendous. It's like, mate, I, I need a month's notice when you're coming around, mate. I need to brace myself. You're fucking exhausting. Knock, knock, knock on the door. I've opened it. I oh, see the old man. I'm like, all oh, right. He goes, oh, just passing. Thought I'd come in. Because what he'd done was he, he started collecting ink toner cartridges. So this is, this, is, this is pivotal, this bit. Ink toner cartridges. So we'd go around fucking schools. Fucking Pete the Sex Case going to school to collect toners. Schools, hospitals, industrial estates, anywhere where like companies use their toners and rather than throw them away, he says, well, I take them uh, and I give the money to cancer research. He doesn't. A little bit of that money goes to cancer research. So he was fucking pulling a moody one there. Uh, so he had this van. This was him going straight. This is actually, I was going to say, he's not done an honest day's work in his life. It wasn't honest, but... It was the closest thing he's ever done to work, was driving around saying, please, sir, I want some more. Can I have your cartridges? Uh, so he's knocked on my door, just passing. He said, I said, all right, come in. How you doing? Yeah, not too bad. In like a Tasmanian devil, boom, boom, boom. They would never ask you how you are. Would never ask how you've been, how you're doing, what's happening in your life. It'll, be, it'll come straight in. Me, I, the... Everything about him, like like you've asked him. It's like, fucking mate, I've not asked you a single question. You're telling me all about what you're up to. It's like, fucking slow down. We've gone in the kitchen. I'm boiling the kettle for him. Now, I've not barely said a word because you can't get a word in with him. 
it's as simple as that. So I'm already I'm absolutely cattle trucked because he's exhausted me. And I'm pouring this tea out and I used to have a step that was sort of elevated from the rest of the kitchen. And he stood on this step, so he's now towering over me. I'd said nothing, a bit like when he, a bit like that, what'd you fucking say? Out of the blue, like what? He's towered over me. Now by this stage, I've got my own business, I've got my own property, doing well, I've got a good network, got some great people right around me, got the best friends that you could possibly wish for. That's another thing that I'm absolutely blessed to have, real, their family. And uh, he can obviously see this. You know, I've got all, all, all my best friends I've been friends with since school. I just don't fall out with people. We just get stronger and stronger and tighter and tighter. Uh, and we build each other up. That's the rules. You know, like a lot of lads have, a lot of lads would do that whole banter thing. Ah, you cunt or fucking, mug, you just mug each other off and it's just bants. We don't do that. We just don't do it. And I, most, I know most people do and there's nothing wrong with it. We've just never done it. It's always like, you look great. How are you feeling? You're looking well. Great new contract. I'm glad you got that. That job's lovely. You know, everything's just... Positive. Absolutely, mate, because I just... Words are powerful. Words are powerful just about to say yeah, that. Yeah, words are powerful. And you've got to be careful what words you use with yourself and certainly what you pump into other people's subconscious because, you know, you say... I've always said, if Brad Pitt lived with me for a year and every morning I come downstairs and I said, Brad... You're an half an ugly cunt. First two days, he'd go fucking leave it out. <laughs> Mr. Hollywood, but you talk, look at the jawline on the geezer. Like, have you, have you seen the six pack? Three months in, here, Brad, you're an half an ugly cunt. He'd start looking at himself, wouldn't he? He'd thinking, has he got a point? A year down the line, he'd think he was ugly. You've got to be careful. So we just pump goodness into each other. Nothing but love, compliments. And again, like, we've got no problem with the, with the whole male love thing. We cuddle each other, we kiss each other. I love you. No problem. So my dad would be very jealous of this, very, very jealous. So anyway, he stood on this step, towering over me, and out of the blue, he said to me, I'd run fucking rings around you. <laughs> what the fuck? I'm like, I said, are you all right? I said, fucking get off that step, you prat, and shut your mouth. Because by this stage, it's like roles have reversed. Shut your mouth, you plum. Fucking know your place. You know what I mean? You've come here in a fucking clamped out old diesel van. Then we're sitting in the front room, boom, 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 having a chat. I'm tolerating him. And uh, he's talking about being self-employed. Mate, he rung up HMRC because he owed the money. Said, Google me. <laughs> <laughs> HMRC, like the, 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 the biggest yeah. firm in the world. Yeah, Google me. It's like, yeah. Pete, they don't care who you are. You're a little fucking idiot from Little Hampton. Anyway, so we're sitting there talking in the front room and uh, he's talking about this new business thing that he's doing, collecting these cartridges and uh, how much it's costing him. And I said, you do know that you can like claim your mileage back or get your expenses through your diesel. And, you know, there's, there's, there's tax benefits when, you, when you're self-employed. And he's fucking, he sort of looked the other way, looked into space and looked at me of, Bit of a fucking puzzled look on his face. He said, really? I said, yeah, it's a good job you can run rings around me, innit, geezer? Fucking idiot. So he's just unaware how much of a fool he is and still thinks he's uh, he's above and beyond everybody else. So where were we, geezer? Just for hope your first time you were going to start speaking out about him. Yeah. It's a good job you remember the questions because I veer off with him. That's what he does to me. He's the only person that will send me off into a... Tangent. Yeah, totally, because there's just... There's that there, there's that bit there, and and what he is is a deflection artist. He's like, yeah, you keep looking there so you can't see what that one's doing. He but, is... Do you feel that, though, that as soon as you speak out against him, you're going to be to blame? So that's a scary tactic to have over somebody as well. Well, this is when I got to know my biological father. Up until the day or just before the day that I publicized what he'd done to me, that was the day I got to know him. I didn't know him before. I didn't know him before, Anne. Fucking hell. You know that time I said I was, when he, when he put me on all them drugs and then he went on to heroin, 
I don't even I don't I don't even know if I got to that bit when I was telling that story because I keep chopping and changing. But yeah, so when when we was on we went on to the amphetamine, LSD, uh, then all the fucking tamoxifen, the DF uh, DF one one eight. Fucking anyone that's that's heavy into it will know what a DF one one eight is, and you would only know what a DF one one eight is if you've been wrapped around fucking people that are involved in that. He then got on to smack. His neighbour topped himself. My old man's neighbour used to come over and smoke a joint with my old man. He was ex-military, just got divorced, vulnerable, used to come over, roll his great big Jimmy Cliffs like that on the table, smoking a great big spliff. And uh, before you know it, he's part of the acid parties. Then I broke. I then went and confessed and told my mum and my nan. I broke down. My brain was so frazzled and sizzled and fucked. I was too scared. Like I, I, had, I lived with severe anxiety for a long time after that. I mean, a lot, every day was haunting, and it was basically it was a it was the aftermath of the drug abuse that he put me through. And I do believe in being accountable for your own actions. I really do, but not when you're 15. Not when you're 15. You're someone else's responsibility, especially like a big powerhouse of a father. Uh, but yeah, so my dad's neighbour, he'd come back and forth smoking spliffs with him, then he got onto the acid, then he got onto the brown. I just, before the heroin was introduced, I broke away from him and confessed uh, to my mum and my nan what I'd been doing at my dad's house every weekend and then slipping into the week and that I'm in a real bad place and I, and I need help. And my mum and my nan, they fucking put me on a strict regime, good diet, exercise, plenty of fluids, plenty of love. I mean, I owe them, man. I owe them massively. That's why I've got a lot of love for women. It was the women in my life that fucking, they pulled me out of that dark hole I was in. That that fucking piece of shit didn't just fucking dig for me. He then kicked me in it. This bloke anyway ended up topping himself. Raging smack habit. Compliments to my old man. So when I initially come out, I come out because ink toner cartridges. Remember I said we'll come back mm -hmm. to the toner cartridges. My dad said to me, right, blinding. I moved, I moved offices. I expanded the business and I, I got these offices. And my dad went, oh, blinding. He didn't say, well done, congratulations, or anything of the sort. Never, ever, ever once did he, uh, did he say anything complimentary. Never. Always wanted to just nudge me down a little bit. And it's not like I was flashed with it at all. Uh, but always wanted to knock me down. And he said, oh, blinding, you've got these new offices, these new premises. I'll, uh, I'll come around and I'll, I'll, I'll collect some cartridges. I said, no, 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 you won't. You won't be doing anything of the sort. You keep your business in your area. Do not come near my industrial estate. I will not be vouching for you. That caused a massive problem with him. And also he saw a picture. I mean, bear in mind, me and him barely used to see each other anyway. And then we'd sort of make up. I'd see him at a boxing do and... It's hard to see your dad when you've had a fallout and then you're in a public place because there's deep-rooted love there. Yeah, of course. Because it takes you back. You feel like a kid again. Do you know what I mean? But I think that's the power he has over people. Yeah, especially... And because I've interviewed a lot of people who's come on and have been through some horrid shit when they were younger and as soon as they've seen the person who'd done the bad to them, they freeze. Mm. They've got the power. They steal that power straight away. Jeff Thompson, who I've been mentioning recently, eighth Dan, absolute killer. Yeah, he called it the parasite. He got abused with his instructor, and he's a kid, eleven, twelve. He called it the parasite. It just became filled with fucking hate and hate and hate. Absolute killer. He said always had my thoughts of killing this man when he seen him. Mm. He seen him eighth Dan killer. Seen him as soon as he seen him, he froze. He stole his power straight away. Oh well, doesn't matter who you are, what you are. Yeah. There's, there's some sort of element of a control he had over you. Yeah, he lost that after a while. I managed to... Get your power back. Yeah, and in abundance as well. To the point, when he comes out of jail, because he got 18 years, he's got to serve nine. He's lucky, actually. It didn't. He didn't get sentenced a few a couple of years later because I think you'd have to do three quarters. I'm not too sure how it works now, but he's got to serve a minimum of nine and he's done five. When he comes out, who knows what he's going to do? Because his whole defense is, I've set him up. I've set up his victims. Bearing in mind, there's more victims that 
didn't go forward because they were scared of him. Like I say, if he'd have got convicted for all the things he's done, which just they're not my story to tell, but I've got no reason to to say anything that's not truthful. I mean, there was a three week trial. The jury made up their mind. So did the judge. How um, did it start though? The first video with the cartridges. How was the what was the main? So thing? yeah, so the so I told him no. Then he went round uh, bad mouthing me to the family, and then on and then on the internet, and I said. And then he started calling. Remember, I said like, he'd go through your network. Mm -hmm. He started uh, going on Facebook, seeing who worked for me, contacting them. Why are you working for Liam? You do know that while you're standing on the door, he's sitting at home twiddling his toes, earning fucking X amount of money on you. You know he's charging this and paying you that. I said, well, yeah, that's the way the world works. Of course, like everybody has to make a profit. Like, but he would try his best to sabotage my relationships, my, my business, everything you can imagine. And then he'd go for my friends and start saying things about me to them. Oh, do you know that he said this about you? And luckily we're so tight, they know that I would never ever say that. So it didn't get anywhere, but it was triggering me. And at, and at the time I was with somebody that had highlighted when I showed her these pictures, which I can show you before I leave, that that's child abuse. And then when you put that together with him walking around with a hard on, shaking his cock about, pretending to scratch his leg, giving you LSD at fucking 15. Shagging about the honeymoon. Rumping his missus in front of me, leaving pornography on this like, whoa, this is abuse. This is abuse. He, he, has, he has abused me. So I said to him, if you carry on, because he was also portraying himself as a saint on the internet like a leader of man, like the all-seeing, all-knowing oracle of life, giving out life advice to people, thinking, fuck me. You spent the majority of your life in the shovel for crimes that you couldn't get right. It's not like you was unlucky. You tried to rob a post office that was closed, you fucking prat. So you're in no position to be giving out, dishing out life advice, pretending that you are a, like, pretending he was a, like an, an intrinsically loving, honest caring person he's not got an ounce of empathy in his entire shit ridden body doesn't care so I said you're not doing the cartridges simple as that I'm not vouching for you and I'll tell you for why because everybody you come into contact with you fall out with them you cannot help yourself. You fall out with them and then you make up terrible lies about them and then you aim to destroy their life. There's no way I'm vouching for you. Just stay away. Fuck off. And he took that as a major, major, major slight and he come gunning for me with lies, with bullshit, with threats. It's like, mate, I ain't a kid no more. You come near me and I think you're a threat. I'm fucking putting you in the ground. And that is gospel. That's not, that's not like, that's not tough guy talk. I'm not trying to flex. <clears throat> that's a fact. You've done enough to me my entire life to warrant me putting you in the ground and not losing a week's, wink's sleep over it. You've got it fucking coming. So none of that worked. Then he took to the internet and then I warned him several times. I said, if you keep trying to tarnish my name, and pretending that you're this good guy, I'm gonna announce what you've done to me. And I listed it to him. You're aware of what you've done. You're aware that what you've done is illegal and evil. And you will go to jail if I decide to go to the police about that. Fucking hell, he just went even more. He just didn't even stop. Doubled up. Yeah, mate. Oh, I just, this is when I got to know him. It's like, wow. And this is a bloke who was in his 50s at the time. The energy. Well, you must remember, like, like a man possessed on them videos, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. And that's him 24-7, 365. So I put a statement out. It was, it, was in, it was in written format of the first post on Facebook. My dad first abused me when I was seven, eight, nine, whatever it was. Can't remember the, the specific age now, but... First abuse was on a chart when I was a child by doing this. He'd done that, 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 and that. I'm fed up of him thinking that he can still bully me. I'm not a child anymore. Uh, I'm happy to take this to the police if needs be. I'm happy to fucking 
smash the granny out of him, whatever it takes to stop this man from interfering and trying to sabotage anything good in my life. But I know I keep flicking back, but I had a girlfriend when I was around the 15, uh, 16 age as well, because we was in the same Sunny Mead flat. He told me, well, after she left, well, in fact, the police come and collected her. Her mum found out that her daughter was staying at Peter Gillette's house in Crawley. Before you know it, blues and twos outside. They've escorted her home. He says to me the next day, he went, here, your slag girlfriend showed out to me. I said, what's that? Yeah, fucking took her top off when you weren't looking. Showed out to me. Just we we could we can we could um um unbox that and go further into it, but you get the gist. Like there's so many things that he's done, so many outlandish, outrageous things, lies as well, all lies, and he's done it to so many different families. Knocked on the door to someone who I won't mention his name. He'd love to come on it because he's got plenty to say about him. I need to tell you about your wife. Showed out to me. We were sunbathing. She pulled her she pulled her fingers to the side. Showed me her pussy. Absolutely destroyed him because he looked at my old man as a, you know, Uncle Pete. Lies. Just a prolific, compulsive liar. Anything to say to destroy another man's equilibrium. Horrendous individual. So he carried on. He doubled down. And then I put my live feed out. <clears throat> and I announced it. I said, right, I'm going to go live. I watched that. I was fucking mad that I watched that, man. Yeah, that is crazy. That was like, what, six, seven years ago? Yeah. Yeah, because the, again, the whole thing on the, on the internet, that went on for years before. Because you were at the height of it, though. You had hundreds of thousands of people and it was getting shared. Yeah. So you had a backing and people were supporting you, which must have made it a little easier, knowing that you had support. Yeah, and I I mean, I, I, I owed it to myself, but I also owed it to people that were putting their, their cock on the block. It's like, well, if you're going to stick up for me, you, you need to know that I'm being totally honest because there's nothing worse than a charlatan and a, and a confidence trickster that's going to feed you bullshit, you know. But I had nothing to gain. That's the thing. That's what, like, there was no financial gain. There was no reward. It wasn't going to shoot me to fame and fortune. It was, it was kill, it destroying me. It was killing the business. It was killing my mental health. It was consuming my, my every thought. It was just a terrible time. Uh, so I went live. And this is the bit that really fucked him, that really fucked him. I said, I didn't want to do this. Well, you've seen it, so you, you may remember it. I'm, and I'm sort of paraphrasing because I can't remember what I said word for word. But I went through a list and I had a letter in my hand that my dad hand wrote me. It was either 96 or 97. No, 96. He hand wrote me this letter calling me a Judas. And on the, he sealed the letter and drew a snake on it. And he called me a Judas because I told my mum and my nan that I'd been taking heavy mind altering drugs for a considerable length of time with my dad. And it's really harmed me. I think I was well within my rights to do that. Like I felt like there was no way out at all from that. And you know how powerful like all them drugs are mixed together and you put it in the mind of the young that's not even, you know, I wasn't even developed yet. You can't be giving drugs to someone with a with a, a an undeveloped mind. It's just fucking terrible. And he's sent me this big long letter threatening me. Yeah, this, yeah, that. He said, one day you'll probably stand in the dock and testify against me. <laughs> the irony of that. But yeah, sent me this horrible letter. Not uh not remorseful. Not I'm sorry, you know, we we done that together. In hindsight, maybe I shouldn't have done that. I didn't realise it would affect you this badly. You know, I'm, a, I'm accustomed to heavy drugs because I've taken them all my life. I didn't think it would have the same effect on It, it could have said anything, but he didn't. I, he was the victim and I was the, I was the bad person for, for coming clean. And I needed to come clean, otherwise I'd be a junkie. Mate, I'd, I'd be dead now. If I followed in his footsteps, I'll be dead. He ended up in a coma. He OD'd on, on when he got on the heroin, he got into it heavy, banging it up in his, in his groin, any vein he could find, ended up OD'ing, was in a coma for seven days. That's another story I won't go into because I know it's dragging on. But uh, yeah, the catalogue of fucking atrocities that man has committed is just beyond belief. So this is what fucked him. I put the live feed out. This is what he'd done to me. And I said, wherever he goes... There's accusations 
that he's fond of young girls. I said, people keep telling me. I've had a friend of his for life concerned that he's spending too much time with her granddaughter. And she's 13. So these are things I'm finding out at the time. So I'm just putting them out there. And then a memory come back to me. And I said, and remember, you was caught in the bath with G's daughter. So G was this girlfriend he had at the time who was older than him. And I didn't remember the girl's name who was like my stepsister at the time. I was nine, she was 13. I said, remember the time you got, you got caught in the bath with a 13 year old, uh, G's daughter. So that was one of the things I said. Then I rattled it off with about, you know, you fucking putting your cock out in front of me, wanking it off, sucking my tongue, get, showing me uh, pornography, f feeding me mind altering drugs. And you're pretending that you're a fucking decent person. You're a fucking pig. And, uh, and I'm now coming for you. I said, I'm now coming for you. And you know, when you said, was there a time I thought this is too much? I said, I don't care if I lose everything. Like I'm coming for you. I get an inbox message. I can say her name, Natasha. She's publicized it anyway. So it's again, it's in the public domain. She sent me a direct message saying, Liam, I can help put your demons to rest. My old man wanted to go on the Jeremy Cole show, do a lie detector. That was his response. It's like, yeah, of course. Fucking low level, brains of a rocking horse. You want me to humiliate myself even further and go on the Jeremy Carl show? Like, are you out of your mind? So I sort of dismissed that stupid fucking uh, idea of his, which he knew I would have done anyway, which then he can, he can then go back to his half with audience and say, see, he won't come and do a lie detector on the Jeremy Carl show. He's lying. It's like, yeah, this is, this is a lot bigger than the Jeremy Carl show, mate. This is serious business. So Natasha has inboxed me, said, Liam, I can put your demons to sleep. Uh, I hope you remember me. Like I was like your big sister, boom, boom, boom. And I said, yeah, of course I remember you. Like, you know, how you doing? And she said, give me a call. I gave her a call and she said, what I've got to say isn't really for, it really isn't for the phone. You know, are you, are you free at all? And I said, well, yeah, like come over at the weekend. This is where I live. She come over, hadn't seen her for fucking hell, 30 years. And uh, we're sitting there chatting and she sat on this sofa here. I'm sat on my sofa there, my usual chair. She come out of it. Now you have to remember, I didn't know this. Your dad first raped me when I was 13. Your dad first raped me when I was 13. And my stomach, it dropped like I was on a roller coaster. I'm like, right, okay, you're going to need to go into, into more detail because that's fucking hit me like a steam train. And you have to remember, I now know that he's a scumbag. I, I know all the things he's tried to do to me to sabotage my life. I know the things that he's accused a lot of people of doing that aren't true. Anyone he falls out with, they're a nonce, they're a sex case, they're this, they're that, the other. And I needed to ascertain for my own peace of mind that what Natasha's telling me is legitimate. She said, my husband saw in the newspaper what's going on online, because as soon as I put that live feed out, it was in the fucking Daily Mail, the Mirror, the Sun, all the, all the papers jumped on it. Uh, because with my old man, you can always put the Cray link in there. It's a great bit of clickbait. Mm -hmm. Boom. And she said, he said to Natasha, her husband, you know, now may be the time to, to come forward and say what Peter done to you. So she said, this is what I'm doing and I'm prepared to go to the police and take this all the way because it's damaged me. It never leaves me. I've thought about it every day since he's done it. I can still smell him on me. He still repulses me. And when I see him on the internet, as bold as brass as he is, I find it utterly sickening that he thinks he's some kind of supreme being, this, this act that he's a messiah when he's a child rapist. I was 13 when he first raped me. And it hit me like a fucking steam train. And I asked more questions and I asked them again and I sort of went around the houses and asked it in a different way and... 
I was absolutely 100% satisfied that my dad was a rapist. And it doesn't matter if you've got scented candles and Barry Manilow playing in the background. You sleep with, with a 13 year old as a fully grown man, you're a rapist. And in his tiny mind, he probably thinks because he didn't jump out of a bush with a balaclava that he's the victim because he thought she wanted to do that. And that was, but the general consensus was he made her fall for him again at the time. Big Peter Gillette in the newspapers every day, off the back of a reality show, Reggie Cray's right-hand man, big personality, loves, I now know all of this. I've looked in, I've dissected that dog like you wouldn't believe, because you've got to know, you've got to know the enemy. And he loves vulnerability. He can home in on that and he can take full control and he can take, snatch your mind and that's it. You're like Pinocchio and he's Giuseppe. You're, you're, the, you're the puppet on his string. And he continued to, to rape her for a, a considerable length of time. And she didn't realize it because she was so young. He obviously thought he's Peter Gillette, narcissist 101. He can do what he likes. So she come forward. She was prepared to go and make a, make a full statement, which she did. Uh, so did her friend. Now I've never met her friend or spoke to her friend. So I don't feel I'm in a position to even mention anything to do with what happened to her. But there was three of us that went to court to give evidence against the, the sexual and cruel crimes that he done to us. Uh, and there was seven other witnesses. So there was 10, 10 in total. And it's funny, I mean, it's, it's anything but funny, but you know what I mean? The viewing gallery was full to the brim every day. The viewing gallery was full to the brim every day. Not one person was there for my old man. All these little Klingons that he had, and there's one in particular. See, I want to write a book because there's so much more to it. And there's one person in particular who, if I mention his name, I get arrested. I've been told categorically, you mention his name, you're even near him in the street. And this is a guy that thinks he's an absolute gangster. I've been to his work, I've been to his doorstep. He runs straight to the police, but very, very verbal online. Very verbal to people what he's going to do to me. But when push comes to shove, I've even, even offered money. He stuck his nose in business, which had nothing to do with him. But I'm not going to give him any more airtime. But I never want to throw another punch again for as long as I live. I've lived a rough and ready life. I've worked the door for years. I've had fucking all sorts of dramas and all I want to do now, if I'm going to lay my hands on somebody, it's going to be to give them a cuddle. I never want to throw another punch again. This one individual who will know who I'm talking about and everyone watching this that know the story will know this clown. That's the key word. Can't say his name. He's one person that I would probably give my life savings to have 10 minutes in a room with him. No holds barred with no consequence of jail. That's another story. And if I explained it in detail, you would fully understand. But going back to the dog. Who was it for you in court like, listening to all that about your dad? Even though you say, you listen, you loved him, it was your dad. No doubt there'd probably been good moments, moments that you thought he cared, moments that you thought he was protecting you, no realising the extent. But how was it actually listening to it, the fucking non-shit, the, the bad stuff, the evil of a man? Like, how did that affect it, you? It was, it was horrendous. And I'd done a fair bit of self-medicating throughout all of that. You know, you'd say, I'd, you'd, you'd see me doing a live feed, I'd have a, wait, I'd, wait, I'd have, I'd have a glass start, of wine. Yeah. yeah, so, yeah, I had to have some kind of, something to switch me off. But I didn't take the piss and go over the top because I needed my wits about me. So I had to find a balance of, so I still made sure I was exercising. But hearing all that stuff about my dad and knowing it was true, because if, the people that come forward that went to court that testified 
that led to a unanimous guilty decision didn't convince me that he was guilty. There are two other people that have, that have come forward that there is absolutely indisputable. I know for a fact he has done what he's done, which he's serving time for now. He's done a lot worse. There's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's another who was a young girl at the time who has come forward and she's quite keen on, on speaking out. She's got no problem either. I won't say her name, but he kicked her down the stairs and she's got brain damage. Kicked a female down the stairs. Hey, that, do you know what? That cunt needs to fucking die, doesn't he? Let's be honest. He's a dog. He's a fucking pig. The, when I, do you know, it gets me angry thinking about him. He's a vile human being. But there's one other person which I just cannot, it's not my story, but what he done, he doesn't deserve to breathe. He's guilty as sin. He's done far more than what the public know, certainly than what, the, what he'll ever let on and what the court heard. But the court heard enough to give him 18 years. In fact, you know, it's like you get your concurrent sentences, you get your consecutive uh, years on top. I'll tell you what, mate, when I was sitting in that court listening to the, I got kicked out as well. He's sitting there doing this to me as he's, as he's in the, uh, as he's in, as he's, he's in the dock. <laughs> mate, I'll tell, well, I'll tell you a few things about the trial that will, that will blow your mind. He sacked his brief. He sacked his brief. After I got cross-examined, and this is what they tried to do to me. They tried to pull on my heartstrings. So I'm up in the dock and they tried to say to me, oh, you know, have, have, a, have a barrier so that you haven't got a, you haven't got to see him. I'm like, no way. I've been waiting two years to look at this fucking animal. There's no way you're blocking it. I want to look at him straight in the eye because he's been avoiding me. If he was innocent and he's this big gangster, the second I've put out on the internet that he's a nonce, why isn't he knocking on my door? Now, there's a good reason I didn't go knocking on his door because he's a grass. And I'm all for dealing with things in-house apart from sex cases. They've got to go to jail. They have to go to jail. You give them a slap, you put them in hospital, you break a few bones, you do whatever. Bones heal. And they're still free to roam, manipulate, and destroy lives. They've got to be, they've got to be put in a cage, in my opinion. So I live by a certain code. I won't involve the law in, in things that they don't need to be involved in. Plus, I don't get in situations like, in situations like that anyway. I'm into two things, making love and making money. And other than that, I've got no interest in beef, but I still wouldn't go to the police for, for something that could be sorted out in-house. But if you're a sex case and you've been doing things like that, it's jail that you belong. So we'll let the legal system deal with you. But listening to the stuff in court was horrendous. And when they cross-examined me, they put me, this was the little trick that they'd done, put me in the dock, and there's a big TV screen. And there is one funny story I will share with you. But they've put pictures of me and my dad up, me and him together, in happier times. When I was a kid and he was on the ferry coming back from Parkhurst on home leave, uh, there was another one of me and him cuddling each other. It's like, yeah, of course there's gonna be a few pictures. There's not hundreds. There's maybe a handful. And he fucking managed to get all of them, didn't he? put them up there and I got up there and I'm looking at them and I'm composing myself. And as I, as I walked through the court as well, I had to walk right in front of him and I just did not stop looking at him. And then when they've got me in there, I knew what they were going to do. I knew what his barrister was going to do. He's Mr. Gillette, that's you and your father in more happier times. And I said, I know what you're going to say. I said, and I'm going to, I'm going to answer you before you even ask the question. You see that? And I, said, I spoke just like this. My cousin will confirm he saw the whole trial. I said, you see that piece of shit there? I said, I still love him. I can't help it. I still get a feeling in my stomach. I despise and loathe him at the same time, but I can't help loving him. He's my biological father and he was once my hero. So you can show me all the pictures in the world. It isn't going to change that. And you're going to want to tell me that I love him and that I've since said X, Y, and Z. So which one's true? They're both true. 
I can't help but love him and I wish I didn't. But I don't love him enough not to stand here and testify against him because what he's done is disgusting and he needs to go to jail for what he's done. So have we cleared that up? Because they wanted to pull on my heartstrings and fucking break me. Make you a liar. Yeah. Like, yeah, they, they wanted to... Because I, I saw... Because the, the whole trial was played out online. So I knew, like, my dad's tactic. You love me. I left him a voice note once. Fucking hell. He kept it, didn't he? It was after his dad's funeral. I was out me nut. Totally off me fucking tits. And anyone that's been off their tits before... Bob's up with a cunt. That's, uh, which is everyone... They will listen to my voice note and they will know it's the ramblings of a man that's had one too many. And it's probably the only time I've said something nice to my dad and he caught it and he published it to make it look like I'm a liar. Why you, you wouldn't say this to, to your abuser. Once you learn about abuse, because I looked into it, other people that have, you know, like what, I've, what, what I endured is minor in the scheme of things and I'm aware of that. And like I said to you earlier, I'm not a victim and I'm not a survivor. I just jump over hurdles when they come in front of me. If anything, I'm a conqueror. But I'm no, I don't like them, uh, I don't like them labels. I just had a situation and I dealt with it. And I encourage everybody else to do the same. Get out of the victim mentality, get out of the survivor mentality. Like you didn't survive anything, you conquered it. Bam. But they tried to pull on my heartstrings. It didn't work. Then we went on from there. And then, oh, he stormed out at one stage as well. Stormed out, the, stormed out, the, out the fucking, out of his thingy in the dock. Pretended to pass out to extend the trial. <laughs> it, was, it, it, was, it was a two week trial, went on for three weeks. The judge just let him say what he wanted to. He's singing, he's gyrating his hips. When Natasha said that his eyes were evil, he walked up to the jury. Said, do my eyes look evil? Shown him all his eyes. Like, Fucking hell, mate. Off his nut, the bloke. He sacked his brief after I got cross-examined. I was very honest. I was very to the point, to the point I got pulled out actually at one stage and said, look, just answer the questions. Because I kept asking the brief questions. I said, well, I said, what would you do in this situation? And so the, the detective was running it, come out and said, look, just... Don't ask them questions. You're there to answer them. I'm like, yeah, but it's so frustrating because all my dad's doing is lying. He's, he's trying to tarnish people. He's trying to, he's slinging mud and he's lying. So frustrating. So the, the, the biggest emotion was anger. Uh, then where, where were we? How were you feeling once you got his 18 strikes? Like, how did, was that feeling? Did you know straight away he was getting a guilty? Oh, well, you're do, do you know, yeah, we were all a bit nervous because there was so... Because if it gets away with it, your life's fucked. Yeah, that's the thing. Oh, yeah, I, I knew that this was, you know, this is this is make or break. But once, remember I said that there's that, there's that, one, there's that one thing you've done to that one person. I'd never let that go. I wish I could fucking say it, but it isn't my story to tell, but... Was that a kid? Yeah, yeah. Was it kids as young as eight? Or was that papers? No, or was it he's got a... He's got a, he's got a, he's got a type, vulnerable teenagers. That's his. Uh, but that's all sex cases, kind of. Yeah. Fit, vulnerable people who totally. they see the weakness, they, they draw the weakness. They Broken family yeah. slides in. Manipulate plays the, the mum and dad. Like I've had many people on yeah. who say they don't just manipulate the kids. It's the mum and dad first, and totally. not, they don't they don't actually make their move straight away. They can wait a year, two years. Oh yeah, until they feel as if it's the right moment for them. Yeah, and and that's exactly right because he is he's got no he's never had an organic platonic friendship or rel relationship or even connection. There's always a hidden agenda. He is a manipulator. If there's something. That's got, there's got to be something in it for him. What a fucking terrible way to, li uh, to live your life. But when he, when he got the 18, and again, because it sounds so outlandish when I'm saying it, sacked his brief, represented himself. <laughs> then he has to have a solicitor there just to sort of guide him. In front of the judge, he slapped this solicitor on the head, gave him a Benny Boy pat on the head, said, you can't get the staff these days. It's like, mate, you're on trial for raping children and you're fucking, you're slapping the solicitor on the head saying you can't get the staff these days. 
Gospel, true story. Sounds unbelievable. Who's the only other person that you know that sacked their brief? Ted Bundy. He's that level. Sacked his brief. He was warned. I wouldn't do this if I were you. It's a big mistake. Narcissism. Can't control it. So all of you, so I'll tell you about the sentences. So all of you in gallery there, none of them were for my dad. Not one of his friends, not one of his followers, not, not even any of his witnesses. The, the few witnesses he had that, that were in the dock for half an hour who make out they were at the trial. It's like, no, no, no. You stood in the dock for 30 minutes of a three-week trial. You wasn't there. <laughs> like, you got asked a few questions. The judge even said to you, what are you doing here? We're not here for your opinion. We need evidence. The dickhead who, I was, who I've mentioned, who if I could get my hands on, I'd give my life savings for, he was like, well, I'm here because I think... Rup, rup, rup. It's like, yeah, you're not here for your opinion. If you can't provide evidence or an alibi or anything that, you know, that's conducive to Pete's innocence... You've got no reason to be here. Off you go. Fuck clown the bloke. Total wally. Uh, so, and the reason that my dad didn't have anybody there is because that, so nobody could have heard everything that was said. He can lie to them. This is what happened today. Leave the bits out. He doesn't want them to hear. But we all heard it. There was, it was a full house. An absolute full. And I'm sure people will jump in the comments on this podcast and, uh, They'll confirm that, which is the beauty of it. Uh, so the sentencing's come. And if we're all honest, it's very hard, especially when your emotions are running high. And we couldn't believe what he was let loose to say. Never once did, did the judge or anyone say, upright, oh, order, you can't say that. He was just, bam. Literally everybody in there, he was throwing mud at them, like making up lies about them, just tarnishing their character as if, as if they weren't credible. It's like, yeah, it doesn't work like that, mate. Like you're on trial, <laughs> not, not, not these other people. And uh, so anyway, jury went out, we're sitting there and because we couldn't believe what he was allowed to say and get away with, we were like, wow, I mean, who knows which way this is going to go. Now, the jury have to be a certain amount of time deliberating. They had to be fucking kept in the room. They made their mind up pretty quick. So, like, we're all thinking, like, fuck me. They must have had it in their heads already. This bloke, like he says, has even been set up. He said, <laughs> so a list of things that he come out with that because he was an anti-Islamic uh, blogger, if you like, Muslims had paid me to set him up. That was one of his uh, lines of defense. I paid the CPS. I paid the uh, witnesses. I'd nobbled the jury. So does anybody believe this fucking arsehole? Anybody like, with half a brain would go, Pff, of course, I, I, yeah. I would laugh, but not through yeah. because you think he's funny, just because of the, the like, him fainting in the dark. <laughs> that would, I would, I'll probably laugh at that going home tonight. Yeah. Thinking, fucking silly bastard. Oh, and do you know what? M more will come back to me, but because I know time's ticking and I don't want to fucking stretch this out longer, I'm sort of trying to keep it as short as possible, but there's so much. It's why I need to write a book. Yeah. I need to write a book and... I think it'd be good therapy for you as well. Yeah. This, uh, well, you'll go home today, you might be a bit drained, but you'll feel a lot lighter mm. and you'll think, because this is, that's heavy stuff. Yeah. To go against your dad mm. and then thinking, part of you might think, are you making it up? Are you lying? Because that's how good he would have been. What, you, do you know what? When you say that, so let me tell you, so that's the, that's, the, that's the final chunk. So when he got sentenced, sorry, when the jury have come in and, uh, have you made your decision? Yeah. So there was eight, 17 charges, 15 maybe, whatever. But there was, there was multiple charges against him. And so rattling off the charges, guilty, guilty, unanimous, guilty, guilty. The ones, were, I mean, yeah, the, the big ones were for Natasha. I think the bits he'd done to, to me, he got, I think maybe 18 months. Now, for the... The wanking his cock off in front of me, guilty. For the giving me drugs, which they class that as child cruelty, guilty. 
for sucking uh, sucking the tongue. Not guilty. That's what he got. He's in the dock. He's just been given guilty. He's, been, he's just been given. He's been given multiple guilties for all the things he's done, raping a thirteen-year-old child. When he got a not guilty for for, for uh, sucking my tongue, he's done this. See, he went. Facebook will know he was lying about that now. Facebook will know he's lying about that. It's like Pete, you've just been found guilty for all these other crimes that are unthinkable. But that's his mind's mental. So he got all these guilties. And I'm thinking, fucking hell, this is surreal. And everyone's sort of cheering. And there's a bloke in the background, he's shouting out, bacon. Like it, there was a lot of hate for him in there because they saw it all. Like he fooled a lot of wallies on the internet, but you can't fool a room full of people with half a brain. And how, and how was that for you as well though, even though you've got the result you wanted, but it's still your fucking, it's such a, I, I can't imagine it, but I can get the just of it with him being the manipulator, but you still, because you're a good guy with the mother of love and the grandma love. There's no love like that. That's why women, <sighs> women run, run this world because <laughs> yeah, the yeah, love mate. and they give the birth and how the, the kid grows and the everything, how it operates. And look, we are providing protectors. I always believe that I'm old school. Like Same. the women in the house with the baby, the baby shouldn't be took away from a mother, but you've got that, not feminine love, but you've got that, you've got that other love the way a woman should love and the way a man should love as well, but we're quite rough and ready. But how was that when you felt people shouting at your dad? Was there any, I know it's such a weird question, but was there any remorse or sadness actually for the cunt? Well, this is the, this is the, this is the sequence of how it went. So he got the guilties. Then it was sentencing on the same day. So we've got asked to leave. Straight away sentence. Straight away sentencing, yep. So we've then come back in and he's looking at me doing this. And I've stood up and I said, you're fucking that. Yeah, Mr. Gillette. All right, so I got asked to leave the court. And uh, then they said, you're going to calm I said, yeah, I'm going to calm down. I'm cool. Sorry. I said, you've got to remember, this is, this is years in the making. And I know he's fucking a bad man. This is, you know, this is retribution. This is justice. And I'm just overwhelmed, but I will chill. So they brought me back in. Now he's being sentenced. This crime, of this amount of months, this amount of years, seven for that, nine consecutive. I'm thinking, fucking hell. It was like 37, 38 years, but all consolidated to 18 mm. years. I'm sitting there thinking, fucking hell, I'm never going to park on the double yellow line again. <laughs> I mm. thought, fucking, when the law comes for you, they don't play games. And again, it's, this will sound outlandish. It will sound like a lot of people I see on podcasts that they sit there and as they get into their story, the fucking nose just gets longer and longer. It's all gospel. As he's getting his sentences dished out, he's going to the judge, give me life if you want. Just give us life. I don't care. Give us life. I'm going to appeal it anyway. Give me life. Just dismissive, lunatic behavior. Didn't care. Maybe he did care but he certainly didn't portray himself as a man that did particularly care on the day. Probably bravado. And so after that, you know, it's like, you can imagine the, like you've been running off nervous energy for, it's been going on for years. I've not even told you how he ended up getting remanded. We'll come back to it. It's, you'll love it though. Tell me. Let me tell you, you're like this. Fucking bloke. This is like, and this is a bloke that sits there on the internet looking into his phone telling people, are you fucking thick? It's like, right, Pete, let me tell people how you got remanded. One of his bowel conditions was you cannot go near any of the victims. Period. You cannot go within X amount of distance of the victims. He's then gone on Facebook and said, yeah, I had an interesting uh, meeting last night of a new friend of mine. Yeah, new legal friend of mine, blah, blah, blah. And I've learned a few things, this, that, and the other. Very smug he was as well. For someone who's got nothing to be smug about, never achieved a thing in his fucking life. I sort of gauge my achievements on how many people I've helped in life. And I fucking, I love it. And that's what, I get a massive buzz off it. He hasn't helped anyone. He's wrecked everyone. But for someone so fucking unaccomplished, you know, half a smug cunt. <laughs> so 
he's put this video out. Yeah, my new legal friend and boom, boom, boom. And I've learned a thing or two. Next day, he's put a video out. He's in East Grinstead. He's a hundred yards from my house. He's going, fucking smells like shit around here. Smells like shit, where am I? Big signpost, King Centre. Exactly where he is, King Centre, East Grinstead. Smells like shit around here, obviously for my benefit. A postman's walking past. He said, here, mate. He said, can you smell that shit? He said, no. He said, oh, can you tell me what the day is today? He went, yeah. He said, what, what date? He said, and what time is it? He said, oh yeah, cheers, bruv. Thanks, mate. He went, yeah. Fucking smells like shit around here. Stopped his video, posted it. It's like, you've, you've just got to grasp yourself up. You're where you shouldn't be. It's part of your bowel condition that you're not allowed to go near any of the victims. You're pretty much on my doorstep, antagonizing me on video, and you've got someone to confirm the time and the date and the day. You absolute imbecile. So uh, I didn't think anything of it. Detectives called me up and said, yeah, just to let you know, you know, we've, we've called Peter back in and he's on remand. It's like, yeah, fucking <laughs> 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 Brain, brains of Britain. Not only does he go and try and rob a fucking post office that's, that's closed, <laughs> like fucking hell spider, it's closed, we better chip. He's got no luck with the post office, no. mate. Postman, post office. Exactly. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> there, there, there's the link. So, uh, yes, yeah, so, uh, so sorry. I had to squeeze that one yeah, in there. Okay. It's, it's hilarious. Yeah. It, it's comical. But he's, uh, so yeah, so he got sentenced and then we've all gone across the road, had a beer. But then after that, that's when, that's when my mind started playing games on me. Oh, so. Just second guessing yourself, yeah. which, you know, I know everything I said to the letter was, was gospel. I believed the other witnesses wholeheartedly. I know for a fact the other people that come forward were telling the absolute truth. One of them was too petrified to go the, the full distance and they've had enough trauma in their life to last them a lifetime already. Prime pickings for my old man. Very vulnerable. But I'm walking around. I stayed in a hotel for a few nights. I... Uh, Everyone that was there that supported me, I said, come on, we're going to go and we're going to go and have a drink. We're going to go to Tunbridge Wells. I booked everyone a room. We're going to sit up and, you know, drinks are on me. Thanks for being here. And everyone was so pleased. I mean, because a lot of people that were there, certainly in the viewing gallery, have, have known him for years and they've, they know that he is a monster. If you think the amount of years he spent in prison, the amount of chaos he's caused in the short spurts of time that he's been out is fucking unbelievable. It's, uh, yeah, you've got someone like Charles Bronson who's s still in jail. You've had someone like my old man who should be in jail that's not in jail. Insane. But then my mind started playing games with me. Did it, you know, that, that, that's your dad, Liam. Did you do the right thing? And then instantly, of course you've done the right fucking thing. Is it, you know, you, no one gets away with that. It's, you know, it's fundamentally wrong. It's disgusting what he's done. And so after my, my mind played play tricks with me, in a sense of, did, was everything I said accurate? Did I miss anything? Did I did I did I put any any vat on top? Did I add any any meat to the bone? I had a real steward's inquiry, questioned myself to the to the detail, until I was then satisfied that I'd done everything above board correct, and I can sleep well at night. And he is where he belongs to be. And it wasn't long before I was just disappointed he didn't get life because he'll come out and he'll wreak havoc again uh but his credibility shot to fuck so i wouldn't even give that a second thought he's fucked he's well fucked yeah he's and fucked he was in lewis right and i had friends in there he'll be, and he'll be buzzing off this Oh, he will love this, this attention. Will, he will absolutely love it. He'll be signing autographs in Albany. Yeah, mate. Yeah, come, come on to James English Pop. Yeah, how, many, how many do you want? Do you want, do you want, do you want one for the family? <laughs> he yeah. will. He's come, so he's come down to go to court one day. So you've got, you got the meat wagon. You've got a load of lads down here, all from Brighton Way. Then you've got him come down, gets escorted down by himself. Obviously, he gets looks, looks after being an once. And they're all shouting at him, fucking. Peter, you sex case, you're coming under it, you're nonce. Blah, blah. Oh, man's going to them all. You shut your mouth, you fucking mug. He goes, you'll all see the truth when you read my book. It's like, no, mate, you wrote your book in court. 
the story didn't stick. All your book is going to be is your bullshit version of events again. He could never write a book. And who's going to buy your book? Like, he, he, fucking... could never, he could never write a book. Nah, what, criminals, but... criminals can't even write books in a, in a whole anyway because they make money from crime, never mind a sex case. So he'll never be able to write a book. He'll have no credibility whatsoever. He would need to move from here because people, he'll be a target. Oh, fucking absolutely. But is it, it still a worry for it... you that he could come out and start all his manipulation tactics again? Do you know what? I'm not just saying this because there's nothing worse than seeing someone on a podcast flexing. I'm more worried for him because there's now children that live with me and a, and a woman that I love dearly that I would take a bullet for. He comes anywhere near, anywhere near. I, I think that anyone's in danger. It ain't going to be good for him. So if anything, I'm, I'm more worried for him. He's best just to come out, shut his mouth, fuck off and lock himself in a hole and consider himself lucky he's still breathing. But is it late 60s now? 64 on the King's coronation. Oh, he the fidget. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He'll be celebrating like it's his day. He'll, he'll think there's a link. He'll go, uh -huh. yeah, of course they made it on the 6th of May. Like, obviously, he will. How hard is it but for you, Liam, just to kind of go through all that and with your dad and the, who he is as an evil man? Like, who has that for you to deal with it afterwards? Like, did it come ahead at any point? You thought, fuck me, like, this is... This is heavy. Have you kind of just dealt with it through your laughter and dancing and kind of as if zero fucks given mentality? We all know when the cameras go off and that who we really are, but mm. was there a moment for you ever just went, that's heavy? Well, the, the full answer to that, which I'm hoping anyone that watches this can get a bit of strength from it and put things into perspective. And I know that you're going to, you'll understand this. There's not been a, a moment in time, not a split second, that I wasn't acutely aware that this is fucking heavy. This is serious business. And I was, I've always been acutely aware that this is damaging and could really, really, really send my mental health spiraling. And it would do, I think a lot of people, it would, it would bring them to their knees. But with the singing and the dance, not the singing, the, the, the dancing and the jokes and the mucking about, that is actually me by default. That's not, mm. that's not a mask. Like, because I've had such, because I've had such, I've had so much shit thrown at me that I've learned not to take too much too serious. And I love a laugh and a joke. Like, I fucking live for laughing. I just do. So that's not, I mean, it's certainly a, it's a remedy and it's a cure and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's the best medicine there is laughing and joking. Like my missus will, will tell you, I'll, I'll be laying in bed sometimes and we're due to go to sleep and I'll start fucking laughing. <laughs> Geezer, and I'll start laughing about something that's just popped into my head and I can't control it. And everyone's wide awake. It's like, for fuck's sake, Liam. It's like, I just, I don't know. I've got a good funny bone in me, which is a blessing. I get that. But I've always been aware that it's heavy duty and I've got to be careful uh, and I've got to watch myself and monitor the situation, know when to hold and when to fold and when to walk away, when to take a breath, when to analyse things. Also look inward. Like I do a lot of that. I don't, I'm not into the blame game. So when I go forward, like I have done for him, it's because I have analysed me. I have thought, is this is this the right thing to do? Am I 100% certain? Have I done anything wrong? But, the, but the, the full answer is that I tell you how I dealt with it in my humble opinion, as well as I did. Don't get me wrong, there was moments <clears throat> I cried my eyes out like a baby, but I lost my nan 13 years ago, 14 years ago. And as I sit here now, I don't accept a day of it. It hurt me more than you could ever imagine. I laid next to her dead body until the coroner got there playing with her hair. <clears throat> she was the love of my life, her and my mum. I mean, I can't, I can't put it into words how much I adored my nan. I fucking love her with every fibre of my being. And when I lost her, there's still called a Nansky. There's a Nansky shaped heart missing, hole missing in my heart and it's never going to recover. So when you've been through that level of pain, nothing else can really hurt you. 
if that makes sense. So I'd already been to my deepest, darkest, saddest, loneliest, traumatic place before this happened. So it wasn't my first rodeo. I'd been, not, it's certainly not the same thing, but I'd been through serious trauma before. And I know some people handle death differently and they accept it and they think they're going to go to a better place and I'll see them again. And me, bollocks, it fucking killed me and it still hurts now. It cuts like a knife, which is very unfortunate for my old man because every tactic that he tried and every low blow that he tried to pull, it's like you're dealing with a man that's been somewhere where I wouldn't wish on anybody. Mm -hmm. I'm still hurting over that. Uh, even through that feud. Fucking, I'm still grieving over my nan. So you're minor to a certain extent. Still heavy. But I think once you've experienced pain, everyone's got their own pain, their own different thing that hurts them the most. That hurt me the most. So nothing could touch me after that. So I suppose, I mean, I'm certainly not grateful for, for ever losing my nan because it was unexpected, uh, which is why you should tell people you love them if you love them because you never know. Yeah, it's hundred percent. Yeah, fucking my dad's brother died. I got got the message today before I come here, which is another reason my mind's all over the shop. I mean, how how weird's that? The day we're doing the podcast, I knew it's obviously going to be about, you know, the old man because the story was so wild. Andrew's died, and he was a poor, poor bath. He really did have it hard. He really had it hard. Locked in cupboards, beaten black and blue. Yeah. And I, I loved him and he was very pleased what I'd done. He was very, very grateful that I'd plucked up the strength to put that dog uh, where he belongs. So yeah, sorry, as That's a long, okay. long winded response to, uh, to the question that you asked, but if there's anyone watching this and they're going through some turbulence or, you know, they're feeling anxious or trepidation or uncertainty, whatever it may be, we're all vulnerable at times. We're all human beings. Just either pinpoint your most traumatic time of your life and remember it ain't going to get that hard again. And also if you're swanning around like you're fucking Mr. Big Dick without a care in the world and you're arrogant and you're fucking, you're punching down on people because you haven't experienced any trauma. Equally, remember, you're going to get a phone call one day that's going to break your fucking heart and it's going to humble you. So, yeah, be yeah. nice. Yeah, I love that, mate. And like, for you coming forward, another, those amazing women, like the strength and abundance, like you say, you're not a survivor, you're a warrior, man. And that's what it takes. Like, to, to go the extent that you've went through, and obviously, when you're talking today, this is a years and years of build up. Mm. Fucking years and years of build up, torment, pain. Am I right? Am I wrong? Is he a good guy? Am I a bad guy? Like that there is mentally fucking draining. Oh, Never yeah. mind seeing the shit that you went through. That's trauma in itself as well. And even though thinking, ah, it's just a normal thing, it ain't fucking normal. If my dad was talking about his pecker out, man. I'd think, fuck's sake, get it in, dickhead. Fucking up and running as well to come. Yeah. Uh, it's like, you know what I mean? Like, it's <laughs> mental. But that's the, there is sick people in this world, but you've come through it and it's made yeah. you stronger. Like, where do you go forward for the future, brother? Future, I, I'm i going to write a book about the whole thing. I was meant to start it at the beginning of the year. Why didn't you? Uh, I've had a few, I've just been spinning too many plates. I've been, I've been juggling too many things, taking care of other people where really I should be. I mean, one excuse is as good as another. I just haven't got the ball rolling yet. We was on a holiday in Mexico, December. Me and the missus agreed. January, start writing the book. And, and I've also, again, I have to be honest with myself. What are you writing the book for? Is it for notoriety? Do, do, you know, do you want to be in the limelight? Or is it, is it because you want to help other people? And... I've had to work that one out and I've got to be honest with myself and I'm very happy to, to say that he distracted me from so many years in my prime of doing great things. Although putting him away is the greatest achievement of my life because I've saved lives. Putting my father away is the greatest achievement of my life 
because he's a wrecking machine and all he does is destroy anything that comes in his path. He's like a human hurricane. He's fucking evil. He's but vile. You're always going to get those questions. I done a homeless documentary and I was going through my changes right at the start and I questioned it. Was I doing it so I could get people to like me and think I was a good guy and yeah. I was doing it for the right reasons. If I'm honest, part of it was probably both. Right. But no matter, I, I said this to our amazing woman, Anne Rowan, who owns Chrissy's House, which is a suicide centre, which I'm an ambassador for. She says, look, James, it doesn't matter why you've done it, son. You've still done it. Yeah. Yeah, and I get that. And I like, yes, it's refreshing to hear you say that because I, I had a little battle with that and I, and I didn't, I didn't want to do it for the wrong reason. But it doesn't so matter, I you're still to, doing it and that yeah. will then help others. So it doesn't matter if it's a little bit of attention, a little bit of fame, a little bit of this or that. doesn't mm. matter. You're doing it because you're a fucking warrior and yeah. that's the main thing there. Same reason why I've done it. doesn't matter why you've done it. You've done it, James. And fair play for doing that. Yeah. Fucking respect. Yeah, thanks, bro. Massive, massive respect. But uh, yeah, moving forward, I'm just going to keep making love, making money and making people smile. And if I can give back... You know, we're all consumers in this world. You know, we're all happy to take, 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 take. But there's something beautiful. There's something powerful about giving back. And uh, so, if I can, if I can give, if I can give, if I can give more than I can take, then yeah. I've lived a fulfilled life, and I and I feel like I've won. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to move forward. Maybe set a plan up. I mean, attention now is currency. If I'm gonna, if I'm gonna build a social media platform again, I'm gonna have to fucking curb some of the things I come out with because yeah you've got you to know. play the game yeah you have got you know to play I mean? the game and I've... this is it like, these things help because people then understand you it's not just the laughing and dancing man yeah it's an understand there's much more to your story fucking hell how's he survived that why is he still going on why is he still smiling but that's the that's it there that mm. thing there because do you know what everybody on this planet struggles and social media is sometimes I don't agree with social media all the time but it fucking saves people's lives it's a, it's one of them, isn't it? It's yeah. a, it's a double sided. It destroys sword. lives, but there's some things people, it's all they've got, and the little motion, motivational posts and stuff. Yeah, makes them feel good for a couple hours, man. Yeah, I get some, I get some nice messages. I mean, when I used to get thousands when it was when I was at a at a at a decent size one, but I still get nice messages, and it still makes me feel nice. Yeah. It's like, yeah, I've I've done my job there. I've put a smile on someone's face that needed it. I'm not too I'm not too fussed with if I put a smile on someone's face that doesn't need it. It's like, yeah, fair play. I'm glad you enjoyed that. But if you need it, like that mm. sort of that that means something. So yeah, moving forward, work hard. I was going to say play hard, maybe play a little bit less hard, mm -hmm. and just uh, yeah, focus on focus on giving and moving forward and self development. You got to keep looking after yourself. I want to you know build a better body, build a better mind. Yeah. Get get my cup right to the top so that everything that overflows I can give away. Yeah. What, that's the one. What about for anybody that's watching it's maybe went through something similar that's maybe too scared to speak out or feel embarrassed or ashamed or blame themselves? Like you that the mind is a mad thing how people react mm. to certain traumas that go through as a kid. But what advice would you give for anybody that's maybe in that struggle and it doesn't know where to turn? The ad the advice is the the, the first turn you make is towards the mirror and you look at yourself and you remind yourself you're a good honest person and you're a victim of circumstance but shit can change if you change but you've got to make a move and I know it's a lot easier said than done and bravery is brave within itself but you've just got to think let me just take one brave step Tell somebody, just tell one person, get someone you trust, get their advice, speak to someone, get it off your chest. Don't let it boil up until you have to start going to the doctors and taking fucking pills to make yourself happy or to get yourself to sleep. Exercise, that's a cure. Go for walks, make a plan in your head what you're going to do. Do not feel like you're responsible for the ill doings of another person because these fucking animals, these predators, they have a very good knack of making you feel like you're the guilty one because they're powerful manipulators. They're, it's, it's in their DNA. It's built within them to, to control, lead and steer you into, you know, making you feel like it's a dirty secret and you're to blame. If you know if you're vulnerable, you know if you're feeling slightly off and you feel like you're one of the weaker ones of society, by setting yourself free, by speaking out to anybody, 
speak to a counsellor, ring the Samaritans, follow the right people on social media. Be careful who you listen to, but be true to yourself and come clear. The truth will set you free. The truth will set you free. And when you confront a bully, you soon see how weak they are. I've never met a strong bully in my life. Never, ever will you meet a strong bully. And if someone's got that power over you, it's just because they've used certain words and mannerisms and body language. And if you break it down, it's like what someone's words have affected me. Someone's movements have affected me. It's, it's, it's just all nonsense. You've got to remember your worth. Remember you're a long time dead and you've got more years to come on the planet. And the best years are going to come as soon as you realize you're not to blame. You cannot blame yourself for somebody else's ill behavior. Speak up, speak out, do it bit by bit, whatever it takes. You haven't got to go grand like I did. Make a journal, write down it all, document it, speak to the fucking police. If you've been a victim of some kind of historical sexual abuse or even current or present, and you feel like you don't want the world to know, you know what? It's not you to blame. It's not you at fault. And if anything, if not for yourself, do it for the next potential victim. That's what I've got to end it on. If you haven't got what it takes to do it for yourself, have the empathy to do it to the next potential victim because you don't want them to go through what you're going through and that will heal your heart and set you free. Liam, listen brother, absolutely proud of you. Thanks for coming on today. Appreciate you having me, mate. Nothing I've, but love, I've enjoyed man. it. Yeah. yeah, man, lots of love your way yeah. too, man. And I can't wait to read your book. Yeah, I can't wait to write it. Yeah, smash it, bro. God bless. Cheers, brother.